What's good, the peoples? How is everybody doing today? Uh, before I even start playing Final Fantasy X, I wanted to look up and see if there's any missable content. And so on the wiki, they have a page just as missable content. What can be missed permanently in every Final Fantasy game? It's pretty consistent, I guess. It looks like most of the stuff that you can miss in Final Fantasy X are certain types of equipment abilities on certain types of equipment. Like it says here that on your first visit to the Calm Lands, there is a merchant that sells a buckler that has magic counter. Otherwise, you can only get magic counter on weapons. It's the only piece of armor in the game with magic counter, apparently. That and Albed Primers. So I have a list of Albed Primers here. And some of these are permanently missable. Yes, when we get to Albed home. Because that location gets destroyed, and then there's apparently one right after Yuna's wedding. So four of the 26 Albed primers are missable. BT Sierra, thank you for becoming a member and making Prompto sing. He does so love to sing. Uh, let me know if the audio needs to be fixed in one direction or the other. In fact, I'm going to turn my TV down two notches. So, it looks like the only kind of stuff I can miss in this game are pieces of equipment that have particular abilities on them. There's not actually a way to miss a, a, an ability entirely. It looks like every possible ability we will have access to uh, but as I go, I'll keep this list in mind. And there's a missable Blitzball player for whatever that means. I don't even know what the hundo is going to mean in terms of Blitzball. I just don't remember enough about Blitzball to really, really know for sure. Alright, let's pull up my itinerary for this game so what i the first pass is begin playing which we're doing today we can check that off story completed i think this game will take this is like a 50 or 60 hour story easily Uh, okay, so story completed. Sphere grid completed for all characters. We actually had a discussion on Discord about which of the two versions of the sphere grid to use. The original version from the PS2 game that came out, or there's the expert version that came out in the international version, which is also available here. So the original version is a bigger grid. The expert version is a smaller grid with more initial freedom. I don't think there's it matters one way or the other. We're going to be able to give every character every ability anyway. I think I'm going to go with the expert grid just... At, like, even the expert grid. I played up to the Calm Lands with the expert grid, and there wasn't even all that much freedom. Like, you put a character on a path, and they're just on that path. So, uh, all Aeons obtained, all Celestial Weapons obtained, all Celestial Weapons upgraded. So, in this game, not only do you have to find the rare weapon for each party member but then you have to do like an extra side quest where it powers up the weapon and they're all super obnoxious uh, all blue magic obtained for kimari all overdrives obtained and all overdrive modes for all characters this game has different uh, overdrives are your limit breaks and there's more than one way to fill up a limit gauge uh in this game like i think each character has a particular starting overdrive mode but you can learn the other ones as you go on i'm pretty sure all characters are capable of learning all overdrive modes if not i'll have to update that uh, all monsters captured eventually we're going to start capturing monsters and it keeps track of how many you've captured in an area and how many of each type 
and then uh, the guy who keeps track of it makes super monsters based on the monsters you captured. So all monsters captured, all super bosses defeated, uh, including, I guess, Penance is the ultimate super boss. I should add to this list all Dark Aeons defeated and Penance defeated because they... This game has regular super bosses and then like a class of like super super bosses above them. Uh, complete inventory, complete bestiary, and... Oh, this one I can change. I have here all PlayStation trophies, but I'm actually playing the Steam version. Uh, one of my viewers was kind enough to gift me Final Fantasy X and X2 HD for Steam, so we're going to go for all Steam trophies instead. But right now, it's just a matter of starting the story and getting into it. Like, we're not even going to be able to start the checklists for a little while. So yeah, my understanding is that the little temple puzzles you can solve, each of the Aeons has a temple. The Aeons are like the summons in this game that you have to collect as you go. And there's like a little puzzle, and if you don't finish the puzzle, you can go back and do it later, but at a certain point in the story, each of the temples in this version of the game, in the HD version, becomes inhabited by a, like a one of the Dark Aeons, one of the game's super bosses. Uh... So we're going to try to make sure we complete every temple on our first pass through. So the one thing here that it says, uh, the player can donate Gil to Awaka only before the Operation Meehan event. That's relatively early in the story. I don't remember what donating Gil to Awaka does. Uh, so I guess however much money he wants, we're going to want to donate it to him before that event. That's relatively early in the story, actually. Like, I think that's within five or six hours, perhaps. I thought donating money to Owaka is something you did in the uh, in the sequel. So I think I'm going to go with the expert grid because it's smaller and it'll be easier to fill all of the nodes on it. Uh, I don't think it's going to be that much smaller that it'll be a noticeable decrease in the grind. Uh, and we'll just... I remember the first time I played this version, I tried making Tidus a white mage, and he just sucked for the entire beginning of the game. So, I guess we're going to go with the expert grid. Um, I don't think this matters. We'll just go arranged. Play the arranged soundtrack? Sure, why not? So, Final Fantasy X. After completing Final Fantasy I, I put up a poll on YouTube. I asked my YouTube members, of which there were seven at the time, and now there are eight. Thank you very much, Sierra. Uh, which of the, like, these four Final Fantasy games should I do a story playthrough next? And this is the one that won. So I, the next poll is not coming for a long time because this is a fairly long game. But that's how I'm going to select which story playthroughs happens. I'm going to ask my YouTube members. Also, if we're at eight members now... Uh, I added new emotes. The emojis should all be there. The rooster and the uh, the chihuahua head. And I added a new 9999 emote that somebody suggested. And then I have more emote slots on top of that. And if we get two more members, I open up seven more emote slots. I have no shortage of emote slots right now. So if anybody has good ideas for emotes you'd like to spam in the chat, let me know. Yeah, there's that 9999 emote. Somebody suggested that. Seemed like a good idea. So, Final Fantasy X. Yeah, I don't like this game <laughs> very much. Uh, it's really just because of the, the... The story is kind of bad, and it's not very well told because the narration in the game, the voice acting, is kind of bad. I think Titus is just an unlikable character just across the board. He's such a whiny face. Oh my goodness. Like, he spends the whole game just bitching and moaning. The battle system's cool, though. I like the battle system. What up, Lone Fox? Uh, so the game has a, the advancement system. It's called the Sphere Grid. You don't just gain experience levels and get stronger and your stats go up. Uh, and it's not like Final Fantasy... 
Uh, nine, where you like pick what abilities you're working on learning. Or eight, where you can customize characters with different spells. Or six or seven, where you equip different magic and then you can learn and use the magic. It's not like five, where you change jobs. Like To find a game this similar in advancement system, you've got to go all the way back to four. In Final Fantasy IV, which we just played not long ago, you gain levels in a hard-coded way and you get stronger... And that's it. That's all the advancement there is. Every character has a preset path that they advance on. And the only thing you can do to influence that path is gain experience levels. So Final Fantasy X has this sphere grid where you have... You, it's that same system. There are seven player characters. Each one has their predetermined path that they have to go on. On the expert grid, we'll get to pick who goes down each path. But there still are predetermined paths. All, the only way we can influence that is to level up. And so the grid is this big, complicated spider web. But if you look, zoom in and look at it, they're just these linear lines, these paths that you follow. And unlike Final Fantasy IV, where your characters just gain levels over time and get stronger, in this game, you actually have to manually go in and push the button to make your characters level up. So it's kind of the worst of both worlds. Like, games like Final Fantasy uh, 6 VI and 7, like, yeah, you've got to go in and fiddle and equip with stuff to determine how your characters get stronger, but you have control over how that happens. Whereas in Final Fantasy 4, you don't have any control over how your characters get stronger, but you also don't have to go into the menu and take time to manually do stuff. Final Fantasy X, you've got to go into the menu and manually make your characters level up in the only way they can level up. And it gets old real quick. I guess I'm supposed to go this way. No? I'm stuck on the first screen of the game. This is not good. Oh, there we go. We just gotta talk to more NPCs. Also, it's super awkward because they allow you to name the hero in this game, uh, which is a Final Fantasy tradition at this point. But this is the first Final Fantasy game that has, like, voice-acted dialogue. So the way they squared that circle is they allow you to rename your character, but just nobody in the game ever says his name. It's really awkward. Yeah, it's, it's something that you've noticed the whole way through the game. Like, I get it. There are people in 2001 like that would have been upset if you can't rename the main character in a Final Fantasy game. Because you, that's something you've been able to do all the way since the very first game. But... <laughs> I, Sebastian, I would hold uh, your, your happiness because I suspect I will be complaining about this game a lot as I play it. So, of the main numbered Final Fantasy games that are not MMOs, there are only two that I don't enjoy, and this is one of them. So Final Fantasy X and Final Fantasy II are the bad ones, but Final Fantasy X-2 is a good one. All Everything I just said is ridiculous, but it's also true. <laughs> So another problem this game has is only characters in your party gain levels. I was in a car. Like I said, you have to spend those levels manually in the sphere grid, but you have to gain them by fighting monsters. And only characters in your active party uh, gain experience levels that you can then spend. So if you don't use a character, that you can't level them up on the sphere grid. And there are seven characters, and you're allowed to swap in combat. So the game incentivizes you to swap characters into battle to take garbage actions just to make sure they remain leveled up. And I realize, like, you don't have to play that way, like, there's nothing forcing you to, but it's really not a good feeling when there's an obvious, efficient way to play a game that's boring. Like, I don't, as a player, I don't like making the choice between do I want to do something boring or do I want to do something inefficient? 
If I have to choose between boring and inefficient, there's something misfiring in the game itself, by my estimation. So Final Fantasy XIII's Crystarium, I it was fine. Uh, for a few, for the first reason is to advance in it, all you do is open the screen and push the button, and the little laser thing just zips all around, and you get all the abilities instantly. Uh, but you reach a point in the game where you do have to make interesting decisions about which Crystarium you're leveling up. Uh, and eventually, when you get high enough, which of the branching paths on that Crystarium you're taking and which ones you're ignoring. Um, and that those decisions start happening much, much earlier in the game than a comparable point in Final Fantasy X, where the sphere grid will open up for all characters... But that happens at like the 90% point in the story. Where in 13, it's like the 50% point in the story. Uh, so character advancement in 13 it feels a lot better. Even though it's technically just the sphere grid again. Um, and also all characters level up equally. So you don't have to worry about, oh, I haven't used snow for 30 hours. And now I can't level them up. Actually, just the opposite happens. Like, you're, the game forces you to not use snow for 30 hours. And then when you get them back in the party, it's like, ooh, I got 3 million points. I can go hold my button down and watch the thing zip around. It's really good. <laughs> I'm going to turn the volume back up. I think the main menu is louder than the main game is. And Final Fantasy games, like, continue to have some version of the sphere grid. Like, 12 had the license board, and then 15 had the ascension grid. Uh, I mean, this cutscene was great. I remember when I first bought this game back in 2001. PlayStation 2 is still a brand new console. I didn't own one. A friend of mine had one. I was playing it at his house. And, like, just... The, the visuals blew my mind in the same way I imagine Final Fantasy VII's did back in the day. Final Fantasy II's problem is even worse, because the optimal way to play Final Fantasy II isn't boring, but the most obvious efficient way is super boring and stupid. We'll get to Final Fantasy 2 eventually. There's, there'll be a lot to say. But, but yeah, the, the, so we're going to do a lot of swapping. They try to make the swapping happen naturally by giving each character like a major strength in battle. Like, Tidus is super fast, and Waka has super high accuracy, and Orin can hit monsters... Uh, that have super high defense. And Lulu can hit elemental weaknesses. Like, they, they try to m make this work. But then you have two characters, Yuna and Kimari, who it just never works for. Uh, Kimari doesn't have a strength in battle. Like, there's no reason to really cycle him in. And then, yeah, Yuna's your healer, but you typically don't heal in battle. Typically, you heal at the end of the battle from the main menu. So if you want to level up Kimari and Yuna, you kind of have to go in and force yourself to do it. Yeah, exactly. Yuna, like, you need Yuna leveled up, because when you get to a boss fight, you really do want her summon magic and her white magic. It's instrumental in boss fights, but unless you swap her in to take garbage at actions in combat, she's never going to level up. Oh yeah, spoilers are allowed. I've completed this game multiple times. Spoilers are allowed for any Final Fantasy game you care to name. Please feel free. 
So I've played this game to completion, I think, three times, and then I have a couple of aborted playthroughs that didn't make it all the way through. Look how dumb that sword looks. <laughs> Dodging the lightning is not even the worst of the celestial weapons. Chocobo racing and butterflies are both worse, I thought. They do try to do like some interesting set piece stuff with some of the boss fights in this game. The degree to which those uh Experiments are successful varies dramatically though. Going after all of them. Cut the ones that matter and run. Like right here, like we want to fight the ones in front of us, not the ones behind us. The ones behind us will just keep respawning, and the ones in front of us we have to cut a path through. So let me actually say out loud where my next Albed Primer. It's on the salvage ship. So I need to find it there. Okay. I think Lightning Bolts probably took me the longest out of all of the Celestial Weapons. No, that's not true. Blitzball took longer by far. Uh, but it wasn't as aggravating. I'm told there's an exploit in this version of the game for Lightning. Hopefully that's true. My dog is very upset about something. I'm going to go try to calm him down before I get in too deep into this stream. I'll be right back. Okay, he'll be quiet now, hopefully. My wife went to run some errands, so he's really, really upset. Oh, I don't know what B and A are <laughs> on this controller. I'll have to see if there's a setting where I can put in PlayStation icons. It thinks I'm using an Xbox controller, but I'm not. I don't think there's any point to using skills or anything here. I think we just bust this tarred up and we'll be good to go. So I think he, I have to like time, I have to line this up correctly. Is that correct? Yeah. Not looking forward to jump roping in Final Fantasy IX either. not going to be fun. Like, so, overdrive modes, like, right now, I think Titus and Orin are both set to, when you take damage, your overdrive fills up. I think that's how it works. But different characters in the game have different overdrive modes, and then eventually, I think we can learn all of them with everyone. I don't know if I should heal here, because he's using a gravity attack.
Like, to give you an idea of how terrible the Chocobo race is in this game, the, the final Chocobo race you have to complete, you have to finish the course in 0, 0.0 seconds. If that sounds really stupid, I assure you it is. Uh, okay. Save. Also, look at Titus's goofy run. My goodness. What are you laughing at, old man? Lauren, let's get out of here. Weird and expected. Huh? Give me a break, man. Also, the main villain of this game is a space whale. That's... Space whale. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> uh, flickering wings is probably bad. I don't know what it does, but it can't be can't be good. Nothing good comes from wings flickering. This could be bad. Yeah, I'll say their wings are flickering. I'm going to take out the wall with the flickering wings. There's always going to be one with flickering wings, aren't there? Is it B? It's not. Uh, so T is going to get a turn. He can kill the Wex wing flicker guy. It's G. It's Mon G. With the flickering wings. Uh, that one's D, so it has to die now. That one is H. If the flickering one is going to get a turn before my character does i want to make sure to take it out because i'm sure that flickering wings means nothing good so looks like there could only be one flickering one at a time though is it g it is overkill just means uh like when your last attack against an enemy does way more damage than it has remaining hit points but I don't remember, like, mechanically what it does, if anything. Go. Oh, it influences uh, drops into fights? Okay, that makes sense. In terms of, like, personal knowledge about, like, the workings and mechanics of Final Fantasy games, 10 is rather low on my list. So if you know a lot about how the game works and you think you can help me out, please f feel free to share your wisdom. So my understanding is that, yeah, Sin was originally... This is the end game. You don't learn this till the end game. But Sin was created to 
defend Xanarkand in a war, like, thousands of years ago. Uh, but, like, right now, because of shenanigans, Sin is, like, the, the, the heart of Sin is Titus' father. And... So Sin has come here to retrieve Titus for reasons I'm not super clear on. I think we do eventually learn all the details, but my understanding is that's why Sin was there at that moment. Oren travels back and forth between the two dimensions. By going through sin, which is something he can only do because he's a zombie. Which is something else you don't learn for many hours in the game. The game's like sets up a lot of these like little plot twists where like information is revealed that end up being either really dumb or not making a lot of sense. So we should definitely try to overkill enemies when we can. I wanted someone, anyone beside me, so I didn't have to feel alone anymore. And Titus wears this, like, gauntlet for the entire game, and nobody ever asks about it. He just wears one gauntlet on one hand for the whole game, and everyone just pretends like this is okay. If you're aware of any bosses in particular that I should focus on overkilling as we go... Uh, let me know and I'll make the attempts. But I'm not extremely proficient with this game and I'm not really knowledgeable about how the bosses will behave. So I'm mostly going to muddle my way through the story, I feel. That's what I mean, is I don't know how to overkill everything. Like, sometimes... Overkill happens kind of naturally, and sometimes it doesn't. Is there anything in this map? I don't... Like, we can kind of go underwater, like, two inches, but... I kind of don't want to scour the whole map. <laughs> There's a really funny map in this game. Uh, it's this just long, linear hallway filled with random encounters. And the beginning of it is a save point. And at the far end of it is a boss fight. So before the boss fight, they put a second save point. So you can stand by the save point and look down this hallway and see the second save point. I think it's the only time in this entire Final Fantasy series... Where you can literally see two save points on the screen at the same time. Like, when there's an obvious side path, we take it, right? We're in the Omega Ruins, right? We can come back here, like, in the end game to f do crazy stuff. Dead things in the water. Oh, Titus can breathe underwater. Or he can, like, hold his breath a supernaturally long time. This is an ability that certain people just have in this universe. And again, they never explain how or why.
Like there are entire underwater dungeons and boss fights, and when you find when you get to them, the game's like, oh, you can only take certain characters with you because they're the ones that can't drown. A uh, unit can play Blitzball in ten two, I think. I am partial to the battle music in this game. The game, the, the soundtrack in this game is actually strong all around. I don't know if I can think of a Final Fantasy game that doesn't have a strong soundtrack. Two and five, I'll stake my my claims there. Those are the games that have kind of weak sauce soundtracks. Yeah, Titus' swords are... They're like, it's like a weird fish hook. It's like Maui's fish hook. That's the shape of it. So I just run, right? Oh, I can't. Oh, I didn't realize you could just change your... Equipment. Is that a free action to changing your equipment? I guess that doesn't matter right now. Okay, every attack is going to do half of my hit points. That's the gimmick here. So we're not actually in danger of dying, I don't think. I hate the boss music in Final Fantasy 2. Oh, it's terrible. In the Dawn of Souls version, anyway. I don't remember if the Famicom version actually has separate boss music for battles. So it, it consumes an action, but it doesn't delay your next turn by much. Is that what you mean by a quick action? Because, yeah, the whole, the whole battle system in this game is predicated on having a turn list, and every time you take a turn, it pushes you down the turn list based on what action you just took. So defending is quicker than attacking. Attacking is quicker than, like, casting a big spell. Like I said, I like the battle system in this game a lot. I think the battles are really strong. Because it's really the whole emphasis... When you're not swapping characters in to take garbage actions just so they level up... The whole emphasis on combat is to examine the game state and make... Like, the best choice you can make on this particular combat round. What's the one thing this character at this moment can do? And it's not... What gives a lot of texture to the combat is... When a character's turn comes up, it's not just their turn... Because you can swap characters in and out. You've got three people on the front line, but you've got four characters in reserve. So every time your character pops up, you can choose between that character or anybody in the reserve... So every single time you input an action, you really have access to five of the characters. So a lot of cool things you can do in the battle system. It, it, it works really well. It's very slow, though, and kind of plotting. Uh, compared to especially the ATB systems of four through nine. But yeah, showing you the action order, and not only showing you the action order, but telling you, like, uh... Oh, I want to go into the config here. Shoot! Okay, so I can't make it give me PlayStation icons. I wonder if I have... Hold on, let me go into my controller settings in Steam. Maybe I have a controller setting in Steam put the wrong way. Because I can't imagine this game doesn't show PlayStation icons. I 
Actually, I wouldn't know how to get to that config from here. Whatever, we'll deal with it for now. All right, I need to go find like kindling and flint and whatever else. Actually, is this it down here? Yeah, yeah. The game does this kind of stuff a lot, like hiding the treasure box down here behind like a weird camera angle. Kind of a butt trick, but this was the first Final Fantasy game that has fully 3D environments, so I guess I kind of see why they wanted to play with that. It's not more of a butt trick than like the invisible hallways you have to search for in Final Fantasy 4. It's just like a it's like the invisible hallways for a new generation, kind of. We're just gonna. Oh, I guess there's paths down here. Haha. -ha. Oh, this is where we came in. The map is pretty good, but your input doesn't always match the direction of the map, uh, which makes things really confusing sometimes. I would prefer the map to like spin along with you so your input always matched. What am I examining? There we go. It's kind of weird they have this like adventure game <laughs> like find the objects thing in this area because it's not this isn't like something that happens again. This isn't something the game just does to you from time to time. I'm aware of them, Praktos, but I've only played this and the 10th 2 and the last mission. And all the rest of the stuff I can give less of a hoot about. Like, my understanding is that, like, Sin comes back in, like, one of the sequel books... And Eunice and Tita, uh, Yuna and Titus break up, or something. Even though, like, he literally came back from the dead to be with her, and then she's like, "Oh, but I'm not super into you." At least that's how I like to imagine it happened. But they're not games, so I don't care about them. He kicks a blitz ball that's a bomb. That's hilarious. No, I don't pay much attention to the... Hey, wait, wait. Like the extra universe stuff. I don't care about like the mangas or... How did Orin have a zomb have a daughter? He's a zombie. Give me a break. Like Titus is faster than this monster, so we're gonna start double turning it in a minute here. Like right here, we'll get two turns in a row.
And so right here, if we attack, attacking uh, is a longer action than using an item. So if I attack, you see it's me, me, monster, me, monster, me. But if I use an item, it, it has less of a delay, so future turns will come a little bit sooner. And it's good that the game gives you that information. You don't ever have to just guess about it. So this is Riku, and Riku has, like, special abilities that Tidus doesn't have yet. She's one of the game's more useful party members because she can do lots of cool stuff, like she can steal to get more grenades. Can I only steal once? No, I can steal as much as I want, apparently. At least from this monster. Can you always steal infinitely in this game, or is it just a... Uh function of this one battle. The steel ability also one-hit KOs certain kinds of monsters. I like the, the, the fanfare, too. This is a nice version of the victory fanfare. Okay, so they steal. It's guaranteed the first time, and then it cuts this chance of success, success in half on subsequent times. I mean, we're not going to have access to Steel until she officially joins the party. And that's down the road a ways. Hey, let me go. Yeah, so when you steal from a robot, they're called Machina in this game, but Machina are just like uh, machines and living machina are basically just robots but when you steal from a robot they fall apart because they're it's like she, she's stealing the components that make up the machine it's pretty funny so there's these are the albed and they speak a language that is just a substitution cipher for english so throughout the game there are 26 albed primers one for each letter of the alphabet and we want to make sure we don't miss any, so I have my Albed Primer lists. The first one we can get is coming up here in the next area. Every time I sit down and replay this game, I'm hoping like this is the time it will click with me and I'll I'll like enjoy it a lot more. But it hasn't happened yet. Maybe this is maybe this is the time. I think this game will also, the story playthrough, will take significantly longer than the two games we've done so far. Four and one are relatively short games. And this is one of the actually longer ones. Oh, brother. The worst character. There is so much of this dude in Final Fantasy X-2. Huh. 
It's like I don't understand. Grunting. Like I'm not a monkey, dude. You said you can say it can make yourself useful. You you understand me? All right, I'll work. Uh, okay, so apparently there is an Albed Primer to be had somewhere on this map. Is that it over here? Aha, Albed Primer Volume 1. Y's turn to A's. So what happens here is anytime the Albed speak, it'll correct each letter for each primer that you have. So when the, when the Albed speak, instead of Y's appearing, it'll be A's. And once you have all 26, the substitution cipher is complete. Uh, so Albert Primer 2 is not until Besaid Village. So it's after this section of the game. When we get to Besaid. I am an Albed Huela. You got it. Yeah, like all of those pink A's were Y's that got rolled over. So you can actually sit down and solve the ciphers as you go through the game if you really want to know what these guys are saying. The idea is you, you're supposed to do a new game plus that starts over with all the Albed primers you already have. And then you can know what the Albed are saying. So here's the sphere grid tutorial. I mean, we can't skip it. You have to spend experience levels to move. Then you have to use items to activate each nodes and nodes are how you make your stats and abilities go up. We're doing the expert grid. I'm glad they show you all the empty windows <laughs> in the tutorial. There's a lot of sphere grid and you have to do all of it manually. Uh, I don't think we need it. There's no point to doing that right now. That's another problem with the game is like, there's no set place where you can sphere grid. So, on one hand, it's like if you are constantly going in and sphere and spending your sphere levels every time you get them, you're spending a lot of time in your menu just for little tiny incremental gains. Whereas, if you wait too long to do a whole bunch of it at once, then you might end up under leveled for a particular area. I kind of wish Sphere Grid was just a function of like the, uh, like a save point. Like if you can only do it at save points and then the save points are paced out a little bit better. But I think that's how I typically ended up doing it anyway. But even then, there's a lot of save points in the game. Like, a lot. Because there's no overworld, the only way you can save is at one of these save points. So, like, every town has them. Like, here's one. We just had one on the boat, and here's another one right here. Like, they're all over the place. So, even, like, do it at every save point. That's how I use my computer. Just 
bang on the screen until it does what I want. So this whole section's underwater, and Titus and Riku just don't, they just don't drown. They're immune to drowning. I'm unclear on whether, like, they can breathe underwater, or whether they can just hold their breath a long time, but I don't, I don't think it matters. Like, either way, it's really dumb. Steal from A. Let's get a whole bunch of grenades. We can't use them at any point in the near future, but... We actually do need tons and tons of just miscellaneous items in this game to upgrade weapons and things and aeons and so getting in the habit of just stealing constantly is going to be very important. Oh, in fact, we should look at the expert grid and see if we can get somebody else to steal a little earlier than we're getting Riku back in the party. I'll take a look when we get to be saved. If I, yeah, if I can get access to steel on the expert grid earlier than getting Riku back, that's that's like that alone is a good reason to do the expert grid over the original one. If it's behind a level one lock, I will leave a, a character unleveled until we get a key sphere. Like, that's how useful it will be to have somebody that can steal and use. So Riku, like, she's kind of a thief and a chemist. They kind of combine the two together for her core character. Boss Tross. When is when do you get your first level one lock? Does anybody know? Like when in the game does that actually happen? We'll try stealing twice. After we get two items, I think we'll be done. We don't want to. Spend, we don't want to like sit here stalling in every single battle, stealing infinitely. It's not Final Fantasy IX. Uh, Chocobo Eater is on the Mihen High Road. That's not super far into the game, so it would it might be worth just not leveling a character at all in order to have access to steal and use at that point in the game. So trigger commands are how they kind of tried to add some uh, some more texture to combat. I guess this is my trigger command. I have to wait for it to come around behind me? All right. So I can't hit it from this position, but it's gonna... Why can't I swim after it? Why isn't the trigger command to, to follow it around? Because the game wants it to do that, that's why.
Okay, so I just I get a, my level one keys for the first one on the on the high road. Okay, good, good to know. Yeah, we'll just leave somebody on leveled until then. Uh, you better heal yourself, woman. So this should be extra damage because I'm hitting his butt, right? Eh, it looked like it wasn't actually. What's up, Bob? We're doing pretty good. I'm glad I get to stream today. I spent all day yesterday uh, finalizing my Christmas video for the year. Attack me, that's right. Oh, did Riku just get the kill? And when monsters die in this game, they turn into like little ghost sperms and fly away. And that's actually important to the lore of the world. So in a world where people can hold their breath for like months and never have to breathe, but they never devised a way to communicate with each other underwater. Like they can't talk clearly to each other. What's this dude doing? All right, bye. Well, you would think at some point somebody would have figured out a solution to this. Like, we need to be able to communicate underwater. What's a good way to do that? So is this the Fahrenheit? Because I don't think I ever put that together in previous playthroughs of the game. But apparently, yeah, this is your airship. The Albed, recover it and renovate it. And then you get to live on it later in the game. And you'll never guess the name of the guy who does this work. Shoot him. That looks really appetizing. Right on. Good old PS2 era stilted animations. Hey. <laughs> 
too fast. I sh shouldn't have any reason to not stream the next couple of days. So you guys will have to look at my stupid face again tomorrow, I'm sure. Hello there. What is your name? Riku. Whoa! You really do understand. Why didn't you say so earlier? I didn't get a chance to. Everyone thought we were up here. Uh, we? Oh, we means you. Um. <laughs> Albed is a really Why stupid language. Anyway? We're it's Albed. Just a substitution Albed? cipher. J.R.R. Tolkien would have been very Albed, disappointed. Are you? I don't even know what an Albed is. Where are you from? Xanarkin. I'm a Blitzball player. Star player of the Xanarkin Abes. I don't know what an Abes is either. Hit your head or something? Um, you guys hit me? Oh, right. Do you remember anything before that? <laughs> like, yeah, if you told Tolkien, yeah, the, the, the correct way to make an, so uh, like a foreign sounding language in a game Xanarkin. is to just use a substitution About cipher player, for English. Ball, That's how you do it. Attack. He would have stabbed you. That's what would have happened. He would have stabbed you repeatedly. I just said things as they came to mind. But then I started to wonder. Did I say something funny? You were near Siri. Don't worry, you'll be better in no time. They say your kid gets funny when Sin is near. Maybe you just had some kind of dream? You mean I'm sick? Because of Sin's toxin, yeah. What did his corpse do when they released the Hobbit movies? A fist pump! There is no Xanarchy. those movies are awesome. There's nothing wrong with those movies. So Highly enjoyable. What do you mean, a thousand years ago? But I saw Sin attack Xanarkin. You're saying that happened a thousand years ago? No way. <laughs> whoop, 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 whoop. I just... <laughs> this running animation? Yeah, boy. That's... That is a running animation right there. I guess we should save again. Who knows what happens next. You said... You play Blitzball? Uh-huh. You know, you should go to Luca. Someone might know who you are, or... You might find someone you recognize. Luca? Uh. Huh. So they have made this big deal about like sin excretes toxins that like messes with your mind. Okay. As far as I can tell, this I'll never happens again anywhere else in the game. And it does, didn't happen to Titus either. Titus is not misremembering anything his explanation is a lot stupider than that but as far as i can tell this whole thing with sin's toxins never actually happens they just explain it as a contrivance so titus has a uh an easy way to explain to people why he doesn't know what's going on in the world or what anything is but you would expect in a world where like the sins toxin thing is a danger like it's something that can happen to people like there would be a way to treat it like the actual thing in this scene is Riku would be like oh hold on a second let me run in there and our medic has 
whatever syringe we can jab you with to clear up your head. We developed this medicine because Sin's toxins have been around for a thousand years. But no. I will say I haven't literally spoken to every NPC in the game. So it is probable, if not likely, that yeah, there are probably NPCs you run into here and there. But this game does suffer, the story of it suffers from the same kind of thing that Final Fantasy VIII does. Where, like, they want a story beat to happen in a certain way, but instead of doing, like, proper setup for it, they just kind of throw in this completely unbelievable setting twist. Like, oh, by the way, you've been playing this game for 20 hours, but here's one of the rules of this world you're in that we didn't mention until just now that will make this story beat work. Instead of, like, letting it flow organically. I just saved, so I'm fine. Final Fantasy VIII has a lot of that, too, and it's it's really jarring when it happens. The really dumb one in this game is uh, when we find out what the deal is with the Unsent. I have never found the, anything about the Unsent to be at all credible. I've had people in the like explain it to me and like try to explain to me why it's credible and why it makes sense and why it's okay, but every explanation I've ever heard I, about the unsent I have found completely lacking. The takeaway is in this world, you don't have to die if you don't want to. Like if you die, you just keep living if you want. That's that's the rule. You don't have to die. Oh wait, so in Besaid is my next primer. It's in the actual village, so it's not going to be out here. And so there are several characters in the game that are unsent. You just find out at some point in the plot, like they, they died years and years and years ago and they just keep going. And they keep setting these up as like these <gasps> gasp, what a twist moments. But they're just dumb <laughs> every time. So the idea is that if you are unsent, you will eventually turn into a fiend. So the fiends in the world, like the monster population, are people who died but weren't sent properly. But you keep running into characters that are unsent and seem to be functioning just fine. Like, again, if this is actually the rule of this world's cosmology, you would expect, like, the church to be like, okay, we're going to train people who are unsent and teach them how to not be monsters. Like, that's going to be our goal. Like, prevent unsent from becoming monsters, not prevent people from dying. But nobody thought of that. Like, it's they just treat it as gospel that if you die, you have to be sent. There's no other option. Because if we don't send you, bad things will happen. Unless the bad things don't happen and you just keep going as a zombie for as long as you want to. So that's the in-game explanation, is that some people in the world like just have stronger willpower or whatever. But that's such a bad explanation. Like... There are NPCs that die in an early story event that we'll see in a few hours. Like, there's this big, tragic loss of life. And, uh, like, the implication is none of those people had a reason to stay in the world. Like, their willpower was super low, and that's why they had to be sent instead of being allowed to come back and live their lives. Like... I just don't find any of it credible at all. The whole unsent thing just exists so we can have a plot twist where some of the characters you find out died a long time ago. I could trust this Waka, so I just had to ask. Um, it's true Zanarkin was... You have to have five or more lines in the game's dialogue, then you can be unsent safely. 
isn't it? <laughs> Long time ago, there were a whole so, lot of cities in Spira. Yeah, I, I just don't think there's a possible explanation that would make any of it credible. Death is something you just you can't play with. Or you have to be very careful when you play around with it in fiction. Like when you start to rewrite the rules of death and mortality, but you don't use that as an excuse to explore those those rules. If you just set up the rule and then tell your story without... Like if you're going to play around with death, playing around with death kind of has to be the core of your story it's one of the things that makes like vampire movies and vampire stories so compelling because they're always about like what if this guy just couldn't die and he lives for ten thousand years and then all the rules around vampires are super important to those stories and usually those stories are about exploring what undeath means and what implications it has to be alive for that long and what weaknesses you have and what other people might want to exploit those weaknesses. But at that time, all I can there are bad vampire stories, but that to me. I, there, I just think there are things that, uh, like the rule of thumb that I recall, is that, like a reader can easily believe one completely impossible thing. If you tell the reader in this story, this completely impossible thing is okay. They're, they're good. No problem. We'll believe this one completely impossible thing. When you start asking them to believe more completely impossible things, the story becomes more and more incredulous. And that's the problem I've always had with this game's plot. Is it starts out with... Uh, I guess we can't go that way, even though it looks like there's a path over there. Like, it starts out with Titus has time-traveled a thousand years. That's not the explanation, but that's what the game kind of has you believing at first. That something, something, and now Titus is a thousand years in the future from where he started. Which is kind of true, but not really true. It gets confusing. But So we're, we believe this one impossible thing. Uh, Titus has touched Sin, and the world he left behind was a thousand years ago, and now we're in the far future, and... Idea? He thinks he can hopefully go back somehow, and the story is kind of about that. So that's the impossible thing we believe. And then every we get to various points in the plot where they're like, oh, by the way, there's this other completely impossible thing we need you to believe so the rest of the story can make sense. And they do that a few times. <laughs> Waka is Bender. Yeah, we're basically just Futurama now. So I no longer can steal. What skills do you have to start with? You can blind somebody. Very good. Ride the shoe puff. Shoe puff is a great word. Like, just objectively, it has like a very... A very fine Dr. Seuss quality to it. Let me get some backup in chat. Back me up on that. Shoe puff. Quality word. We're down. Hypello is a pretty good word too. Like, I don't have any qualms with the Hypello in this game. Or in the sequel. But like Final Fantasy VIII does the same thing partway through the story it's like oh by the way we, we now need you to believe that gfs rob you of your memories but not like immediately like it takes like we okay we want you to believe this just enough that like we can have this reveal that you all grew up together in an orphanage but like we don't want you like you to keep thinking about it because if you continue to think about it too much It'll make the rest of the plot look dumb, and we don't want that. So, yeah, we want you... Like, GF steal memories, but kind of not really, and it takes a long time. That's the buy-in that Final Fantasy VIII has you, has you on. Yeah, 
Yeah, this battle music though. This is battle music is good stuff. In fact, this might have been my favorite battle music in the series, just like standard random encounter music until Final Fantasy 13. So Waka is the third character we have that can breathe underwater. So Tidus, uh, Riku, and Waka are the three that can do that. Let me go. Got a favor to ask you. You want me on your team, right? Blitz tournament coming up. All the teams in Spira will be there. It's so huge. I'm sure someone there will recognize you. Then you can go back. Winning that first Blitz Ball tournament is a pain in the butt, but I think we need to do it. It's kind of tricky because if you know how to play Blitz Ball, winning the first tournament's actually not bad, but it's the first time in the game you play Blitz Ball. Like, you don't get to, like, practice the minigame or anything before then. Uh, oh, and you can miss the jet shot if you don't pass the jet, sh the jet shot cutscene properly the first time. two things that Spira and Zanarkin had in common. I wasn't too far The first time I played this game, I didn't really like any of the characters. I didn't think any of the characters are really likable that much. One of the problems is, like, too much of the cast are just the supporting cast. Uh, Waka, Lulu, and Kimari are in the party, but it's very clear that they're not major characters, and they're just kind of there to be along for the ride. I think it was a mistake to start you in the game. Like, when the game starts for real and we start the journey, having most of the party assembled at that point, I think, was a mistake. Uh... I warmed up to the casts, though, especially playing the sequel. I warmed up to Yuna and Riku a lot. The quality of the voice acting is much better in the sequel, which is a big part of it. Ten years without a single win will do that. My first match last year was my big chance. But something else was on my mind. I couldn't focus. Nice excuse. Hey, hey. So, you want to win the next tournament? Go out Like, Kimari doesn't even have a line of dialogue until, like... 15 hours so, in. What's our goal? I don't care how we do. As long as we play our best. We give it our all. I can walk away happy. Uh, no, 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 no. If I say what's our goal, you say victory. When you play in a blitzball tournament, you play to win. Victory. I don't think we have to do any blitzball until the end game. We have to play the initial tournament. And it's worth winning. Like, you get good stuff if you win, as I recall. But I don't think there's any reason to do any Blitzball at all until we complete the story and get on into the endgame stuff. If I'm not correct about that, if there's any reason to play Blitzball as we go, please let me know <laughs> so I don't miss something important. Crusaders. Huh? Crees of what? What? You forgot that too? Hey, sorry. Don't worry about it. I'll help you out. Cool. Yeah, that's what I, that was my recollection. Is sure you can get prizes for winning Blitzball, but the only prizes actually Crusaders. worth getting are uh, Waka's weapon and his limit break stuff. Which we don't even have to start doing that until the end game. There's no reason to do that at all at any point in the story. Unless there's a really rare sphere worth getting at some point, I think I'd rather not do any Blitzball until the end game. Because remember, my goal is to do a story completion and then start grinding all the stuff out for the almost perfect save. I don't know any prayers. God does not exist in Zanarkin. Not that he would know that. You must have forgot or something. Here, I'll show you.
Getting Yuna some early black magic would not be a bad idea. To give her something to do in random encounters. Oh yeah, if there's a Steam trophy associated with it, I guess I do have to win that tournament. Any Blitzball player would know that prayer. It was the Blitzball sign for victory. God, these cutscenes are just so awkward to look at. Like, these characters just don't move. It's so uncanny valley. Like, even Final Fantasy XII does this way better. Which is only a few years after this. I'm just looking for items and stuff in here. It might be worth to do a little bit of blitz for attack reels. Attack reels is Waka's best overdrive, as I recall. Oh, let me see if I can... Alright, so yeah, we both just have stoic. When we take damage, we fill up overdrive. Uh, somewhere in here we have the Crusader's Lodge, which we'll find in Albed Primer. Maybe I better look up the Steam Trophy list real quick, just to make sure. FF10 Steam, or FF10 HD, Steam Trophies. Uh, let's see. Find one Albed Primer. Clear the Cloister of Trials. Learn the Jack Shot. That one's missable. If you don't, if you screw that up, you can't do it again. Uh, okay, so this is a storyline one. All party members come together when Riku joins the party. Dodge two hundred lightning strikes. That's not one we're gonna do immediately. <clears throat> view the underwater date scene that's that's just a cutscene we watch that's not something we have special we have to do uh do all, get all the chocobo training win a race with a catcher chocobo with a total time of zero 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 oh, that's so dumb uh get five treasure chests during the chocobo race at rimium temple so let's check racing stuff. We can't miss that. Uh, defeat Unaleska. That storyline stuff. Obtain Anima. That's an Aeon. Obtain Mega Sisters is an Aeon. Find all Albed Primers. Learn all Blue Magic. Uh, Jekt Spears. Looks like none of these are missable. Whatever Jekt Spheres are, I don't know. Uh, celestial Weapons. This makes sense. We're going to have to do all of this nasty stuff. Uh, defeat Seymour Omnis. Defeat Yu Yevin. Those are the final bosses. And then the rest of this stuff looks like endgame stuff. Defeat Nemesis. Defeat Penance. Win a Blitzball match. We can do that at any point. Win a Blitzball tournament. We can do it at any point. Unlock all slot reels. Is walk is limit break. So winning the first tournament at Luka doesn't give you a, a unique achievement. It's just when you first win a match and first win a tournament. A complete Sphere Grid for all characters. Buy every sphere at the Luca Theater. View Eternal Calm. Do this from the launcher. Oh, this is like the bonus story thing. 
Uh, it's a video we have to watch. Uh, do 9999 damage. Do 9999 damage. Spend 100,000 gil in bribes. Steal 200 times. And an achievement for obtaining all achievements. Okay, so the only one of these I think we can actually miss forever is the Jack Shot. All the other ones I think we can go back and get at a later date. Excellent. Oh, get Jack shot later by riding the boat again? I didn't know you could ride the boat again, to be honest. I didn't know that's a thing you could do. I mean, it's... They do a lot of good world building in this game. Spira is a really, really interesting setting. Like, you get to see, like, the people sitting here weaving. Like, a lot of work went into making this a really well-realized setting. Oh, Edgar's upset again. So, okay, another one of the, uh, the, 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 one of the things that the game asks you to believe is, like, this whole world, like, Sin attacks these people over and over and over and over and over and keeps killing people in every city in the world, every town, every village, but everybody continues to live on the coasts. There's an entire, like, main continent that you can move into that you never get to see in this game. Like, nobody lives there. Like, nobody thinks, let's move inland so the giant sea monster can't attack us. Like, I realize that, yeah, Sin can fly and he it probably wouldn't solve the problem, but nobody has ever even thought to try it. But it hasn't. I'm sorry. I really don't know anything. To tell the truth, I don't even know what the Crusaders are. Talk with the dog? You're kidding, right? Sin. Yes, sir. The Crusaders are sworn to battle sin. <laughs> we have chapters throughout Spira, accepting all who wish to join our struggle. Like, we don't get a good look at the continent until we get, I think, the airship gives us access to what the world map kind of looks like. But it looks like this big, lush continent. Like, every, every location you visit in this game is either on an island or on the coast. Nobody in this universe is like, let's try to go inland and mitigate the damage from this giant sea monster that defines our entire existence crusaders is to protect the temples towns villages and people of spira so like it, it's that's possible maybe the inland is uninhabitable for some for whatever reason but like they need to address that in the fiction they can't just leave it there as a looming question like if it's all completely uninhabitable that's fine but like why Like, even that explanation would have its own problems. We must go now. But it'd be better than what is in the game currently. You're a cat. There's supposed to be an Albed primer in here. I can't do anything with the cats. Do you have it? Like, this NPC here. Where did she look? Where did she go? <laughs> like... It says it's in here, right? It's Albed number two. Yeah, Besaid Village, Crusader's Lodge. The thing is, though, this isn't a low-technology civilization. They have access to all kinds of machinery and magic and stuff. Like, I just don't find that a credible explanation. They, now, for religious reasons, they choose to not use machinery, but... But soon, we may... We've got a plan. There are also factions in the world that don't follow that religion, but they also don't try to use their technology or magic to live inland. Okay, 
So, like, just have an NPC somewhere that explains. Is this the dog I need to talk to? That's a weird looking dog. That dog has rabbit ears. The Albed live in a desert island. Home is on an island still. But the, yeah, they have the technology to live. Oh, it's uh, Biggs. There he is. Or Wedge or whichever one. I don't want to leave this area until I find this Albed primer. The Albed exists in this game. The Albed's whole thing is that we don't believe in Yevin and we're going to use the technology that we find. We're going to use this Machina that Yevin has banned. So there are people in the world who do have access to high technology. And even they're like... This is the Crusader's Lodge, right? I just didn't click the right thing somewhere. Or this list doesn't... isn't correct. I don't know, it's just, it's, it was an opportunity to explore something in the fiction that could make the setting better, and instead they just never address it at all. And, like, we have a sea monster. That's why everybody lives either on islands or near the coasts, is because our villain is a sea monster. That's why. Is it behind the lodge, maybe? It's supposed to just be on the floor in here, apparently. And it's not. Oh, I'm worried. <laughs> I'm starting to worry already. Oh, it is. Okay, this, this dude was in the way. Gotcha. Cool. Alright, so this list will be useful. Our next Albed Primer is... On the Leaky. Uh, which is a boat we get to ride later. Excellent. It's Sin's Toxin, right. Everybody has Sin's Toxins. Like, oh, if we go inland, we'll die immediately. But it can't be because it's all desert, because there's a civilization that lives in the desert. And it can't be that it's, like, all too mountainous or cold, because there's a civilization that lives in the cold mountains in this game. So these things are possible. Like, what is it about the continent that makes it impossible for people to live there? I began to realize how different this world was from my own. <laughs> Unfortunately, I just think the reason is because our villain is a sea monster. That's why all the locations are in or near the ocean because otherwise the sea monster wouldn't work 10 years have passed since lord brasca became high summoner and finally we receive a statue for our temple well what's a high summoner uh, i i got too close to sin's uh, toxin <laughs> it was funny hearing myself make the same excuse over and over. Funny, and a little sad. The summoners are practitioners of the same. Like yeah, throughout history, all the major civilizations occur like gained a prominence on oceans or near rivers or something. But like expeditions were made inland. Like not literally every human being lived along a river, or on an ocean it's possible to live in all kinds of places so what he meant. all throughout human history what is that we should respect I, was, I just don't find it credible that, like that not one group of people in this world like whatever is happening inland it can't be worse than getting eaten by a sea monster every 10 years like let's let's give it a try And if people have tried that and failed, like, the failures would be interesting to hear about. Like, maybe 
Waka and or Lulu or whatever could instead of just having the same backstory as everybody else, like Lulu is one of the members of an expedition that went inland and it went really sour and here's why. And then she can explain it to you. And then she has a different backstory than every other character in the game, which is all just, uh, we were all summoner guardians <laughs> and now we are again. I think we gotta talk to Waka. Is there something back here? I'm gonna go back here. Oh, this part of the map doesn't exist. Gotcha, gotcha. Take a nap. You look pushed. The hidden treasure behind the house? Yeah. There's like a pile of potions and stuff. But it's for me. Waka is big on following the rules. People are searching for him now. Thank you. Who cares whether he comes back or not? But he might die. Fine, let him. Do you? Do you hate him so? But if he dies, You'll never be able to tell him how much you hate him. So, the reason I don't think that explanation works... Like, there's no water inland. That's why nobody can live there. Is because when we get the airship, we will actually get to see the continent. And it's like a regular-looking, like, lush continent. It doesn't look like this barren, like, red wasteland... It's not just completely rot. Like you can see the forests and the jungles and stuff. So there are there have to be sources of water out there. There must be rivers and lakes and just regular geographical features on this continent. Why they didn't just have the whole world be nothing but an art like a, like one like archipelago? I don't understand. Like they could have. This is something they could have just. Hey, we have a sea monster, so we have to make the whole, like, every, the whole world is just this collection of islands. Maybe somebody was like, oh, we just did that with Chrono Cross a few years ago, so we can't do it again. Like, there's just no explanation for why the consonants in this game is completely uninhabitable. So someone is in there somewhere, and they haven't come back out. Right, I got it. A day's already gone by. Is it particularly dangerous in there? Sometimes, yes. We let monsters inside for no reason. There's already guardians in there. <laughs> Besides, it's forbidden. Hey, but what if something happens? What if the summoner... I don't know, man. I feel like if my entire family got killed every ten years by a sea monster, I would stop listening to the church that told me that it's a good thing that every 10 years your whole family gets eaten by a sea monster. Okay, so the Cloister Trials. So that we have to solve this, but we have to also do the, like, bonus solution thing. Let me see if I... I, I don't remember this solution, but I remember these are not very difficult. Like, we'll figure it out. Like, the world building in this game, it's all, like, very surface level and very visual. Like, remember the old, like, Fallout 3 uh, criticisms were, like, 
like what do these people eat like there's this whole wasteland and it's populated but like nobody is farming and nobody is raising animals or anything like what are these people eating that's the kind of question that goes into good world building and it's the kind of thing that uh this game is lacking in certain areas I don't know anything about how membership levels work honestly you might have to cancel and then re like re membership i can i can research it and answer the question for you next time i stream but i i do not have an answer at the moment i should point out that i haven't played fallout 3 i just remember reading a lot of articles about it back in the day so, this is not first-hand knowledge that I have. So, I need a Destruction Sphere for there, probably. Also, you can't carry more than one sphere at a time, which just makes these puzzles ridiculous. So the puzzles dungeons in this game aren't even very good. <laughs> so I usually really enjoy puzzles in a game. But when the puzzle is only difficult because I'm not only allowed to carry one sphere at a time even though there's obviously I have two hands makes me turn off hey it's gotten into you hey it's okay only summoners, apprentice summoners, and their guardians can enter here. It's a tradition, very important. So what about you? <laughs> Me? I'm a guardian. A guardian? Oh, was that the whole dungeon? That was it? Summoners go on a pilgrimage. I think I screwed that up, because I did not get a destruction sphere. I thought we were like in the opening area of the dungeon. So maybe maybe you do have to cancel and re uh, resubscribe in order to go with membership tiers. What are you doing? You think we'd be able to handle it? No, it's uh, it's just. See, I, told I didn't you mess up. I'll just reload. I don't have to sit here and handle this. I can uh, I can quit and restart. <laughs> Oh, you know what? Let's watch this stupid 15-minute video, actually. Guys, I'm going to take a two-minute break and go to the fridge and get a fizzy drink. I will be right back to watch this whatever it is with you. 
<laughs> you have gotten a little chubby. <laughs> and you're not even the one having the baby. Two years. I've learned how to hold my breath for more than two minutes now. It takes more than physical skill, and there are some kids you can't be taught. It took practice, lots and lots of practice. I just had to keep trying until I figured it out for myself. And you know what? Back then, I didn't think there were any tricks to it at all. I didn't have time to think. I'm eternally crying. Alright, I took my jacket off too because it's actually starting to warm up in here a little bit. It's not much. So I guess this is like a movie that takes place between Final Fantasy X and Final Fantasy X 2. Is that the idea? I was really remembering there being more to these little cloister dungeons. No, so later ones get more puzzly. Like, that wasn't even a puzzle. That was just examine the thing, then examine the other thing. <clears throat> oh, is it not showing the video? Oh, okay, yeah, cause that makes sense. Hold on, I can fix that too. I should be able to fix that. Maybe I can't. Hold on. Let's do a Steam window. There we go. OBS is finicky if you quit playing a game while you're streaming. I don't have any of the bot commands working. I can't figure it out. The thing says that the bot is in the channel accepting commands, but and I have the command set up, but I don't know how to actually access it from the chat. But I can answer the question nonetheless. Grandson, please join the youth league, you see. I've nothing against the league, mind you. It's just me and the mystic belong to Minyoven. My grandson used to attend all the party meetings with his parents at court. That is, until one day. I'm sure being around people his own age. This is Lulu. Lulu is our rat terrier. Let me make sure she's set up on camera here. She's our rat terrier. Our dogs are named after Final Fantasy characters. And Lulu is a terrific name for a dog. So that's what the command is supposed to do. Is once per stream, you can use it to make me go get Lulu to say hi. She will be a year old in February. She's still a puppy. And she's the weirdest looking dog I've ever owned. I have, like, she's so goofy looking. She's got these big gangly legs and no tail. They cut her tail off when she was a puppy. I don't know why they do that, but they did. So you've got a little stumpy back here. But I put a command in the bot so people can make me go get my little dog once per stream to say hi. But the bot doesn't work. So I'll work on that and try to figure it out. No, Edgar's not a command. Me and Edgar don't like each other. You don't want to see Edgar anyway. He's gross. He's old and gross. And he has a stupid haircut right now. <laughs> so hopefully I'll get the bot commands actually up and working. If you can't tell, I don't care about this movie at all. I don't. I really don't care what this storyline is, but I have to watch it to get an achievement, so I might as well just do it right now. So I have command the bot commands once they once they actually work. This is one of the things you can make me do is go say hi to Lulu. Are you ready to go back into your into your cage? I think I interrupted a nap. She was just straight chilling. You ready to go back? Okay, let's go back. Hey there. What is it? Another visitor? No, no, I just wanted to chat, yeah? It's just uh, the old folks in the village. They'd like to see you get, uh, you know. And who is it this time? Well, they're saying it's the son of the chairman of New Yevon, yeah? Tell them no. 
And then we'll have to replay some amount of the game. I think I saved somewhere in B-Sade. Maybe I forgot, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what's up with the bot. So I use software called Stream Elements to like make the alert pop-ups and things happen. But the YouTube integration in it is not great. I use it because uh, there is no YouTube integration in Streamlabs OBS at all. It just does not exist. So I have to use this third-party website to do it, to do alerts and stuff. So it has information to put a bot in your channel, but it might just be for Twitch. It might not work for YouTube at all. So... So by this point in the story, I guess, if this takes place between the two games, then Titus is dead. <laughs> Titus dies at the end of the game. He doesn't die. It's more complicated than that. But he's gone. And uh, that's one of the things that, it, that affects Yuna's character arc in Final Fantasy X-2. Is dealing with this guy that she was super into. Being gone. That, that's what kicks off her adventure, really. That's why she goes adventuring to begin with. Oh, I just put her back in her cage. She's in there taking a nap. He's having tea with Eris and Galuf, yes. <laughs> So when I used to stream on Twitch a lot, I had a command for, I had a Rydia command. So at the time I had a Chihuahua named Rydia. Rydia unfortunately died back in April, but I do still have the Rydia emote. You have access to it. If you remember, if you look at the emoji lists, one of the emojis is still Rydia. So Lulu was my wife's second choice for a girl's name from the list of Final Fantasy characters because she thought Rydia was the prettiest name on the whole whole out of every Final Fantasy character she knew. She thought Rydia was the prettiest. And then she thought Lulu was the second nicest. If she was your girl, what would you do? Oh, is that what this little vignette is? Is like this explains how Yuna discovered the sphere? With Shuyin in it, who she thinks is Titus. Oh, there's the there's the Rydia emote. Oh, it's so nice. I enjoy seeing it. <laughs> Sebastian, thank you for sciencing that for me. That's it's good to know. Hopefully, the process wasn't too uh, ornery for you. Hopefully, it was just clicking a couple buttons. But I appreciate you finding it out. But yeah, typically like on Twitch, whenever my dog started barking, people would just spam the Rydia emote in chat. So it's a good just general dog emote. Feel free to spam it as much as you want. I said on Twitter back when Rydia died, I said, keeping the emote forever and ever and ever. Never getting rid of this emote. There's a little, like, interlude like this in Final Fantasy IV as well. The PSP version of Final Fantasy IV. That kind of tells the story of what happens between that and, like, the main game in the after years. But that's playable, I, if I recall. This, I think, is just a long cutscene. It's an in-engine cutscene, too. Understood. I shall return as soon as possible with a full report of our investigation. Solid for three months, yeah? And everybody wants to see her. Oh, yeah? Well, what about what she wants? Well, yeah, but... Okay, maybe once things calm down, you know? And what if they don't, Waka? What then, huh? Don't believe it. 
for everything Yuna did for us. Why can't she just do what she wants to do now? Why? You know, every time I visited here, I wondered why it's God, when I played Everyone's 7 remake recently, I I didn't I don't know any of the voice actors in 7 remake, but Jesse sounds exactly like Riku and I swore like that's the one voice actor I picked out. I'm like that's that's Terra Strong, like right there, but it wasn't in the credits of the game. It's somebody else that just. It seems weird that Square Enix would hire a woman that sounds like Terra Strong to do a voice of a character who sounds exactly like Riku, and not just hire Terra Strong, who's already doing tons of voice work for them anyway. Like. It actually caught me off guard because it was actually distracting playing 7 Remake and having like Jesse sounds exactly like Riku does in this game. And I've played so much of 10 too that Riku's voice is very clear in my head. So I was actually surprised that it wasn't her. But she's like one of the most prolific voice actors on the planet. She's in absolutely everything. And she has good range, but some of her characters do end up blending into each other quite a lot. So Yuna has two different colored eyes because she's like a weird chimera mutant woman. But the colors of her eyes were chosen because the PS2 has a power indicator, like an LED, but it all like it was one of the first consoles where you're not supposed to power down completely. It just goes into sleep mode. So it has like a power indicator and then like a like it's currently on and running indicator. And it was a green light on the left and a blue light on the right. And so it's thought to, that's it, that's thought to be a reference to the PlayStation 2. Oh, we just got the Chivo pop up, so this must be about over. Uh, this being like one of the early PS2 games, like I think this was Square Enix's first major PS2 game, but they made her eyes the same color as the PS2 LEDs. A weird bit of trivia. <laughs> Her voice can be grating, if you're talking about Terra Strong anyway, but like a lot of the characters she does, she's chosen because she has that kind of quality. Like it's a little annoying, but also endearing at the same time. Uh, the first character that I recall her doing was Bubbles from the Powerpuff Girls, way like so back in the, the very early aughts i've got to show you guys my steam window every time i close this game down again and just so i hope you get you enjoy seeing my steam window every couple hours that i realize i messed something up and have to go back and replay it oh we're way back on the salvage ship huh But if I pick the auto save, like okay, yeah, we gotta gotta replay it from here. Whoops. Hopefully this is after like the boss fight and stuff. I can't skip skip any of this either. You play Blitzball? Uh huh. You know, you should go to Luca. Someone might know who you are, or you might find someone you recognize. Yeah, because she has this kind of like nasally, kind of waifish sounding voice that she gives to most of her characters. And if the character like, has that sort of quality, I think it works really well. Like, I definitely think it works for Riku. Uh, I think the same actor did Twilight Sparkle in the, the horse anime show. But like, she's also done Batgirl. And I don't... I'm sorry, I didn't buy her as Batgirl. Like... And one thing, Batgirl sounding like a 15 year old just didn't do anything for me. The top one was in the Bisei Temple, but it was after the point where I had 
finish the temple. It was down in the area where we met Lulu and Kimari. So we had to back up. I guess I didn't save it all in Bisei Village. My Xanarkand? Some kind of holy place? Oh well. Yeah, if this is the worst thing that happens to me today, but I have to replay like half an hour of Final Fantasy X, I think I'll live. Kevin? I'll make sure to save before going in the temple this time, though. I should have done that previously because I knew about the Dark Aeons and stuff. I, I thought I'd get some kind of, like, prompt or there would be some kind of signposting that was more clear that this is the end of the temple. Like, I thought that was just in the first room of the temple. Because all we did was pick up a, spear, a sphere and turn around and put it in a hole. And then that was basically it. It was all over. Oh, well. Okay, so we did actually get an achievement for watching that little movie. I hope you guys found it interesting. So that's the kind of story that I'm not super enthusiastic about. Because, uh, yeah, that's the story of how Yuna discovered the sphere that sets her on her adventure in Final Fantasy X-2. But that's not really a detail that I cared about. Like, what's interesting is that she found a sphere of Titus, not how she found the sphere of Titus. It's not of Titus, it's of Shuyin. Shuyin's a different character. Like, I, I, I saved there, right? I must have said no to that. I'm such an idiot. So, there's a similar thing in Final Fantasy XV. Way more egregious. So, in Final Fantasy XV... Uh, Luna Freya gets a magic ring that she's supposed to give to Noctis in Altitia when they meet. Uh, but something, 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 and then she's not able to give it to him, and the ring is taken by her brother Ravis. So you don't actually get the ring until much later in the game when you confront Ravis. But the ring was given to her by Noctis's father in Insomnia. His, his father had it, and so... They're like, we're going to make a movie. So they make a movie called King's Glaive that's all about how Luna Freya gets this ring. And it turns out the answer is uh, the king just gave it to her and said, give this to Noctis. Like, the movie is about a little more than that. Like, it's about the fall of insomnia after Noctis leaves. But it's like, it wasn't information that I thought was crucial to know to the story. Because that kind of thing never ends. When you're trying to satisfy that sort of minutia, it never ever ends. Because, like, okay, yeah, we've explained now how Kimari found this sphere and gave it to Yuna. But now the next question is, why was Kimari in that place? Was he sphere hunting? What was going on? And then now we need another 15-minute cutscene to answer that question. And then it just raises more and more and more questions. At some point, the questions cease to be interesting. I've definitely missed all the destruction spheres before. Because I guarantee you, I have accidentally solved these temples. Like, I just did. Because the puzzles are so incredibly basic. It's either easy to just accidentally solve them. And then... Not want to go back and fix it. But in this playthrough, I have to go back and fix it. So everybody's just wearing two pairs of pants. Everybody's wearing jeans, right? Like you see, everybody's wearing, we got jeans on, okay? And then over the jeans, we have like <laughs> these yellow pants that go up to our thighs and then connect into our belts. I don't actually know the answer to that question, Bob. I think I don't think YouTube would ever give me a better cut than Patreon does. The best way to support my channel consistently, if you want to, is to go on to uh, Patreon or to use the donation link down in the doobly-doo. It's true Xanarkin was destroyed, right? A thousand years ago? But as for the actual numbers, I don't... 
I, I YouTube gives me a better cut of memberships than Twitch does of subscriptions. Uh, but Patreon, I get virtually. I think it's north of eighty percent actually, and it might be higher than that. When and with uh, like an a donation, it's even higher still. I appreciate everybody who's offering the support. I'm glad people are asking these questions. Uh, so the best way to support the channel is through Patreon, but I realize that a lot of people just prefer to support channels inside of the platform itself. Because there is a culture of watching stuff on YouTube and supporting your YouTubers that you like to watch without having to leave YouTube. And I want to make sure that people have that option. That's why I enable Twitch subscriptions and things. And it's actually a little easier for me to keep track of my YouTube members than it ever was for me to keep track of my Twitch subscribers. So when, I, when I'm able to start uploading regular, just daily videos again, I'll be able to roll everybody who's a YouTube member but not a Patreon supporter into my uh, shout-out list. I've got a, a, a spreadsheet that I keep. All active supporters of $2 or more on Patreon. I could go that goes into my shout out list. So at the end of every YouTube video that I put up, somebody from that list gets a shout out. And then once the whole list is depleted, I click a little box and a little green light turns on and everybody is eligible again. So I just randomly pick somebody to get a shout out in every single YouTube video that I edit. I hope I can get back to those sooner rather than later. So the thing about Patreon, just a little difference here, is Patreon pays you every month, once a month. My payday's off the 5th. The 5th of every month I get my check from Patreon. YouTube and Twitch, and I'm sure other platforms, but those are the only two that I'm exactly familiar with, only pay out once you reach a threshold. Uh, so like if I don't make a certain amount of money. I think it's a hundred, maybe, a, maybe it's only a hundred dollars. Maybe it's not too much, but uh, like I know on Twitch, it is a hundred dollars. If I don't make a hundred dollars in a month on Twitch through subscriptions or bits or whatever, I don't get paid that month. That it, it rolls over to the next month and then maybe I'll get paid there if I hit a threshold. So with Patreon, you can make sure that you're, Pledge goes to me every single month rather than every other month, if you prefer that. Is it also $100? Well, YouTube is tied into Google AdSense. And Google AdSense, I think the threshold is $100. Unless that's been changed, but I don't think so. My payments from YouTube still say Google AdSense on them. So either that's still the case or I'm grandfathered into an old system that's been updated on their end. Who knows? I will not forget the, the Albed Primer. It's not a missable one anyway. We can always come back here and get it. I just kind of want to make sure that I get them as we go. Uh, for my own edification. It's just easier for me that way. There was a treasure box down here. There it is. So I typically to this, I, I do get a check from YouTube uh, usually every month. I, I'd say probably four out of two out of three or four out of five months usually. But every so often I end up skipping a month if my ad revenue is low on YouTube. Because my ad revenue was my only revenue source on YouTube until I started streaming here very recently and turned on the membership kind of stuff. Uh, So it wasn't completely uncommon to have a month where I didn't hit that threshold on YouTube for ad revenue. It's definitely my preference that ad revenue never become the biggest portion of my income. That would be... That just sounds hellish.
Let me go. Got a favor to ask you. Kiss him, you fool. You want me on your team, right? Hmm? Yeah, I have no interest in fighting the dark aeons until the end game. So I want to make sure we clear these temples properly the first time. So I, I mentioned this on previous streams, and I'm going to keep mentioning it every time it comes up, because I feel like a lot of people don't understand this. If you're watching a YouTube channel and the ads are outrageous, like they're too numerous, like they keep popping up, it's because whoever is in charge of that YouTube channel set it up that way. That's not, I mean, YouTube provides the options to run ads basically whenever you want. So if you're watching a channel and you think like, man, I've been watching this video and I've seen three ad breaks, that's too many. It's because the person in charge of that channel decided that video needed to have three ad breaks. Uh, for my channel, I leave turned, anything that doesn't show up in the video itself, I'll leave turned on, like, like banner kind of stuff. Uh, or skippable video ads, like the little, like the thing you gotta watch for four or five seconds before a video, but then you can push a button and it goes away. I'm happy to run those because those don't interrupt my video. You can either watch the ad or not, I don't care, but it doesn't interrupt the content. Mid-roll ads are not, as of yet, pushed onto anybody through YouTube. You have to you have to activate those. So if you're getting frustrated watching too many mid-roll ads on YouTube, it might just be time to unsubscribe to that channel. There's a Mega Man X channel I was watching recently. Uh, I've been watching a lot of Mega Man X uh, speedruns recently, just getting into it. People doing challenge runs and things. There's one channel in particular that I'm not going to name because I'm, I'm about to badmouth them. Uh, but their mid-roll ads are insane. Like, I'll be out on my couch and I'll turn on their channel and want to watch their playthrough. And so it's a 90-minute playthrough. Skip the first ad, that's fine. Ten minutes later, there's a second ad break. Ten minutes later, there's a third ad break. Like, in a 90-minute video? Come on, man. I just want to put a video on the TV and doze off to it. And the ads are always so much louder than the content. Do you guys have that same problem? Where, like, you're, you're watching a video and it's, like, a reasonable volume. And then suddenly, like, the ad break comes on. It's like, Doritos are the best! And you're like, I know Doritos are the best, but that was too loud. Who are they? <laughs> no, YouTube does not. I mean, they, okay, they push them on you in the sense that they're turned on by default. Like, if you go into your ad settings and you haven't unchecked uh, mid-roll ads turned on by default, they will be turned on by default for every video, and you have to click them off. But again, that's still something you control. I also want Doritos. I would love some. Not a very Christmassy food, though. Let's can we agree with that? My wife's gonna bake Christmas cookies tonight when she gets back home. So I have I have oatmeal raisin cookies in my near future. So. Just to peel back the curtain a little bit, if you guys aren't familiar with how YouTube ads work, um, I always, I don't ever, ever, ever want to run a mid-roll ad on my channel. If you ever see a mid-roll ad on any of my videos, please tell me, because it means I forgot to click the thing, and I can always just go in and click the thing, and I'd be happy to do that. Not that he would know that. You will get pre-roll ads on the streams, yes. But I don't think you should, you shouldn't get mid-roll ads on stream. I know Twitch is pushing that right now for uh, partners and affiliates. So. You will get ads whether you're a member or not. I mean, you can always just install, install ad block, you know. But ad revenue is a very, very small part of my income. It was always very small on Twitch as well. My, my income is primarily people deciding to support my channel 
and then like weird nickel and dime work that I do here and there. So there is the 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 philosophy that I okay I don't want to install ad blocker software because that penalizes the creators. And it's true because if you install ad blocker software, you're not running ads and a lot of channels do rely on those ads. But at the same time, a lot of sites that rely on ads, they run really just abusive ads. I don't mean abusive like in content. I mean, their ads will take over the entire site to the point where the content is secondary. The content is driving the ads rather than the ads existing alongside the content. When you reach that point, I think as a consumer, you are perfectly within your rights to simply say, you know what? I'm not putting up with this anymore. Hey, so you. I do not fault anybody for wanting to run ad block software because I totally understand how completely annoying. If I could install ad block software on my TV, so I could watch a Mega Man X speed run in peace, I would do it. But I don't think I can. I own an Xbox One. The only thing I use it for is I keep it hooked up to the living room TV so I can watch YouTube and Twitch out there. That's it. That's all it gets used for. I have not played a video game on that thing probably since my first playthrough of Final Fantasy XV. So... What? You've been fighting 800... Uh, uh, well, we've steered sin though. If you want to support creators, but you don't want to watch ads, what you can do is just install the adblock software, then ask the creator, like, what's a good way to support your content? Everybody's got a Patreon. Everybody's got a, a tip button. Everybody's got merch to sell. Like... Everybody's got some way you can support them if you want. I gotta talk to Waka now. So just the primer and the treasure boxes were all I cared about here, I think. Present yourself to the so my understanding is that the membership is just uh, a little praying might do you. I guess he wants me to go to the temple. I actually don't know how the YouTube Premium works. Like I understand how it works in the abstract. You pay YouTube Premium, and then you don't have to watch ads anymore. But I don't really know what the creators get from that. I suspect to make that work that YouTube would have to give some kind of premium payout to all their creators. Maybe there's a breakdown. Maybe I'll check and see. Maybe it's been on my email that I get from them whenever I get paid. But but it's a, it's a marginal amount, I'm sure, for each individual creator. YouTube is the one that gets most of the money from those premium memberships, I'm almost certain. But for my part, I'm okay running ads alongside videos, and I'm okay putting ads in front of videos that you can skip. I'm not okay running ads that are not skippable, and I'm not okay interrupting the content with an ad. I might do it someday as like a joke in a video like you might watch a let's play someday where I do something really stupid and then cut to an ad just because it's funny to me but I'll, I'll never do it as just a re matter of course and even then like that joke would not be funny enough to justify the annoyance so what's a high summoner Yeah, platforms are always looking for new and exciting ways to make ad blockers not work. I know a few years ago, uh, it was the case that at that with that version of ad blocker at the time, 
YouTube videos just sometimes wouldn't load. You, you'd get an error message instead. You'd have to reload the video, and if you did, you'd get to watch the video. So I spent a few months just reloading every single YouTube video, which, by the way, still less obnoxious than watching an ad or clicking the button to make the ad go away. Because I don't have to wait five seconds to click my refresh button. It's right there. So what he meant... Was that we should respect some kind of the best way to support creators like that, that you enjoy on the internet is to find out how you can give the money directly. That's always going to be the best way. Ads are never, ever going to be the best way for, for like independent creators like me. Once you get into like big conglomerates, like large companies making structured contents that have to pay hundreds of people like when you get to that level ads are going to be better yes because i thought i was supposed to go upstairs now maybe now it's time to go talk to waka again and then i take a nap and then i come back here okay so i, I every platform wants you to feel bad about installing ad blocker but you should never feel bad about installing Adblocker. Simon, take a nap. Yeah, take a nap. We're almost back to where we were. We're getting there. I'll put it this way. I'm a content creator. I make money on the internet and I use Adblocker. <laughs> so on my PCs, I never watch ads on YouTube ever. Only on my Xbox. And maybe you, maybe there's a version of ad blocker I can install on Xbox. I don't actually don't know. It's been nearly. It's been nearly a day already. Perhaps you could go look for us. People are searching for him now. Yeah, but for like the Netflix model, uh that's a subscription model. That that works because they're a gigantic company with like hundreds and hundreds of people that they're paying out. When you're like at the level of making YouTube videos, like I'm at, even a like a major YouTube channel, even somebody pushing like a uh, hundred thousand views plus, like yeah, that person's getting good money on ads, but if they can find a way to monetize the channel in another way by selling merchandise or by like setting up a like a Patreon kind of thing, they're going to make way more money with that. It's, that's why every when you get to that level, like everybody's got their merch that they sell. That's because that's where people make their money with by selling merchandise and branding, which turns into free advertising. Which gets other people turning into the channel. Is something so, wrong? the cool thing about merch is that it's something that you want because it's got like the guy's face on it or whatever. Instead of ads being this like cold, impersonal nether sphere that we all just kind of have to deal with. Remember? So someone is in there somewhere, and they haven't come back out. Right? I got it. Day's already gone by. Is it particularly dangerous in there? Sometimes, yes. <laughs> Why don't you go in and help? There's already uh, we don't have an Android TV. I don't even know what kind of TV we have. I don't use the TV to watch my stuff anyway. That's why I've got the Xbox out there. Because navigating the TV menus with our stupid little remote... It's a Roku TV. That's what it is. It's a Roku. Uh, but the remote is awful and... It's just nicer to navigate menus with an Xbox controller. Maybe. Yeah, I just saved outside. We just saved in town. Well, it doesn't matter because now I know where the friggin' thing is. Like, and now I know what not to do before I've done all the other stuff. But yeah, we saved when we got to town. If the wording on this is what I think it is, then... Because I'm pretty sure this says something like, Besaid spheres are also necessary. But there was only one Besaid sphere, not plural. 
Nitpick, nitpick, nitpick. So don't place a glyph sphere. Yeah, besieged spheres are also necessary. There's only one before the ending. We only carry one sphere at a time. We're not going to explain why. All right, so let's put that back. Oh, maybe there were two besaid spheres. Oh, this isn't a besaid sphere. This is a glyph sphere. Never mind. Oh, I do have to place these in order to open certain doors. So don't place the last one. Well, we know where the last one is now, so... That one gets used up. I think that's where the destruction sphere goes. Nothing back here. And this is the last sphere that we need. So let's take this. And see if there's anywhere else to put it. Where do we put it here? Cool. Now it's there. Uh, this one is... Oh, I can take this one out of the door. Sure can. Are you upstairs? I have a recess here, too. Like, we're just going to have to keep, try every sphere and every recess. Okay, I'm going to take this one. Thank you. I'm going to put it over here. It, it, I cannot articulate how much it annoys me that you can only carry one sphere at a time. It... It annoys me so much, so... I have too much respect for good puzzle design in games that it just really irritates me so much that I can only carry one sphere at a time. Because the only reason that you can only carry one sphere at a time is if you could carry two spheres at a time, the puzzles would be easier. And if I put this one back in this wall in here. Something's going to happen around the corner. I am not going to tell you that because I am absolutely going to max out everybody's sphere grid. 100%. All right, I think that we're done here. Now we can go get the b -Sade Sphere. Which I put over here. We're going to do all kinds of really stupid stuff in this game. In the pursuit of the almost perfect save. We've already done some really stupid stuff in Final Fantasy IV. <laughs> so the basic idea when you're designing puzzles like this that are supposed to have some kind of presence in an actual world the idea is that the puzzle you're solving isn't just an abstract puzzle like a Sudoku or something, but is actually a sequence of actions 
inside of the world. It not only has to make sense as a puzzle, so the solution has to be satisfying, but it also has to make sense in the world. Like, the solution is the only way it could go. If you can break the puzzle by doing something that's not allowed, then it's fine as a puzzle, but it breaks as a sequence of actions in the world. That's why, like, in Mists, there's a puzzle where you have to put a key in a lock, and you're not allowed to take the key, so they chain the key to the thing that is locked. Just to make sure that you can't just take the key or with you in anywhere you want. Of course, Mist has the same problem where you can only carry one page at a time. What are you doing here? So maybe that was a bad example to bring up. Because now I'm a hypocrite for being mad at Final Fantasy X but not Mist. Mist is a better puzzle game than Final Fantasy X. Let's just leave it at that. So, I don't think my wife knows who Lulu is. She picked the name, but I don't think she actually knows anything about the character. What I should do one year is, uh, her sister is a, is a seamstress. She makes dresses and stuff. And I think she does some work on, like, uh, like cosplay costumes and things. I should get her to make, like, a little eight pound dog size Lulu dress one year. So one thing about this game, I don't like the grinding to me, I'm resigned to the grind has been our motto. That's, that's the catchphrase we've decided to go with. Uh, most of the grinding in this game, I think is going to be pretty chill. Um, it's not going to upset me to grind levels. It's not going to upset me to go capture monsters and things. I don't think this game has a lot of stupid rare drop kind of stuff. After the celestial weapons are taken care of, and after we're done with Blitzball, I think the grind in this game, there's going to be a lot of it, but I think it's mostly going to be pretty chill. Final Fantasy XII is the one I'm worried about in that regard, because there's just a lot of stupid rare stuff. Uh, monsters that only spawn under very specific conditions. It's going to require a lot of trial and error. But... I'm a little bit looking forward to the grind in this game. The capturing monsters... Filling out the sphere grid. I can't see anything. I think we'll get to a point. I might be wrong. Maybe it'll be just incredibly tedious, and I'll just be sitting here for okay. hundreds and hundreds of hours. But I don't think so. I think it'll be chill. Hundred levels to kill. I mean, if there are tricks like that, I'll look forward to learning them. One of the little side effects of doing this series is it's going to cause me to have to learn a lot about these games that I don't already know. There are certain games in the Final Fantasy series where I'm, I'm practically an expert. I know basically everything there is to know. And then there are entries like this one where I actually don't know very much at all. And it's going to be a lot of fun to learn some of those things. Like, I learned one or two new things about Final Fantasy IV, but there's very little you can still teach you about Final Fantasy IV. Or V, even. I've spent a decade doing Fiesta runs with, like, an actual app that I run that has all the mechanical information in the game. Like, it would it would blow me away if I learned some new thing about Final Fantasy V that I never knew. But I'm open to the idea. It's possible. never seen anything like it in my life. Sure, it was a little scary, but still, I could feel a strange kind of gentleness coming from it. I learned a lot about the bosses in Final Fantasy IV 3D. We have to play that game two more times. Um, we're not going to change any of these names. I'm okay with all these names. Valley 4! That night, 
We talked for the first time. I, mm, I learned how to sort that, items, that's true. But after that night, everything changed. For everyone. For me. I need to move this up a bit. So the stream probably froze there a second for you. I had to move my window up because it was covering up my timer. I can't see how long I've been streaming for. His memory's a little fuzzy, so don't mind him if he says anything odd. Come on, say hi. I would just start insulting all of their mothers. I'd be like, yo mama fat, yo mama ugly, yo mama stupid. If I had carte blanche, like, oh, don't worry about it if he says something weird. I would just be firing off the yo mama jokes. I'd be junior high all over these guys' faces. I'd be like, I did your mom, I did your mom, I did your mom. To bring the Crystal Cup back to our island. That's all we need to do to win. Easy, huh? Stay away from the summoner. Why why do I have to stay away from the summoner? Like, I, I have to spend the whole game next to the summoner. Stay away from the summoner. Oh, are we, we just quoting. Oh, I'm a bad man. Woo! Yuna, be careful. But it was really my fault to begin with. I'm a bad man, but I'm not an evil man. I don't have a pink knife. So much for your help earlier. Huh? How did I uh, help her? I just I'm sorry about showed that. up. Wasn't that? Wasn't I not supposed to? Guess I kind of overreacted. Oh no, I was overconfident. Um. I think I would like know. Yuna's character more if she didn't uh, spend I... so much time apologizing Please to everyone for everything. Like I get it that it's her char like one of her character traits is that come play with me some more. Like she's trying to follow her father's footsteps, so she constantly like has this inferiority complex and she's constantly seeking approval from her guardians and her friends. But it's just I don't like the character style. I like her character in Ten Two a lot more. And it shows growth, like it's a character arc. It's it's intentional. Like her character in the two games is different because she gets over a little bit how she is in this game. She becomes more confident and more assertive. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna do her absolutely. It's gonna happen in a lake with like fairies flying around, and she's gonna be crying the whole time. It's real weird. That's not going to happen. If you get tired, let me know. I had a bed made for you. <laughs> All right. I don't think there's anything else we, we can do. In... I love this old lady. Stay away from the summoner. Best NPC. Like, did she just not see we just had this whole conversation? All right, I'm gonna stay away from the summoner. Ready for bed? Yeah. Oh, like I go to bed with Waka. Like, do we? Are we gonna spoon? We're we gonna have a man spoon. Nobody has blankets in this world. Blankets don't exist. Nobody lives in on the continent and nobody uses a blanket. Go straight back in town, talk to the shop, and then find the dog. Got it. Right now, I gotta do whatever this is. Where's that boat? Everyone will find us if it doesn't come soon. You really sure this is okay? Would you take me to Zanarkin? Hey! You said you'd go with me! Oh, hey! I thought Waka told you not to get any ideas. He did. Uh, 
Yeah, so you're coming with me. Hey, stop dreaming! You with a woman? You can't even catch a ball! <laughs> oh, what's the matter? Gonna cry again. Cry, cry. Like, I understand what this scene is communicating, but it's just so incredibly awkward. Huh? I remember as a new player playing this game for the first time, like, none of this scans at all. Like, it's com it's incomprehensible unless you already know what the dynamics are in play here. Because the first time you see this scene, you don't realize it's just a dream that he's having. Like, because you think he's a time traveler. Like, maybe this is a flashback or a flash forward. Like... What a weird scene. It's just incredibly badly written. There's a, there's a lot of real hard cringe in this game. Lulu is not dressed appropriately for life on a tropical island. Can we just all... Like this heavy leather dress with belts and then this fur... The dialogue in this game is sure something. Uh, scary. So, who's Chapu? My little brother, Chapu. And it's so weird in a game with voice acting. Like, this is what I mean. This game had bad voice direction. You saw an example right there. You have two characters talking to each other that pronounce the name Chapu differently. Titus said Chapu, even though he just heard uh, Waka and Lulu talking about him. And then Waka says Chapu, which is, I guess, the correct way to pronounce it. But it's so very clear that there's nothing conversational happening here. These two actors... We're just reading a script, probably in on di in different rooms on different days. They never actually talk to each other. It's got to be somebody's job to make sure, like, when you say a character's name, everybody's pronouncing it the right way. Otherwise, it stands out super, super bad. There's a hilarious scene in Metal Gear Solid, the first one. That's a series that usually gets this kind of, like, little niggle right. Usually, somebody's watching out. But there's one scene in Metal Gear Solid where Meryl pronounces his name Otakon and Snake doesn't correct her or laugh at her about it. And nobody was like, oh, hold on. It's actually Otakon. We'll do another take. No, nobody thought to do that. Same thing happened here. Like, no one was like, oh, it's actually pronounced Chapu. We need you to say Chapu. Because in the, in, the, in the story, you've just heard another character say it. So you would know not to say it Chapu, you don't like Titus wouldn't know how it's spelled. I don't think anybody in this game had that job of actually directing the voice talent. Hey, sleepy head. Something I want to give you. Whoa, you're giving this to me? Yeah, use it well. So this is Chapu's blade. That's the sword you gave Chapu. Well, you never used it. Where's Yuna? We're taking the same boat as Yuna, right? Why do we gotta wait here? Yuna came to this village ten years ago. When the last Replacing Lulu with Pain is was the correct choice, I think. If that's actually true, if that's actually the reason why it was done that way. But she had the talent. Yeah, Lulu would not have been an appropriate character to have for the tone of Final Fantasy X-2. You can't have a mom in the party. That that can't have a babysitter in the party. Pain kind of does fill that role in the party. Like Pain is the level-headed one, but she's also one of the gang. So. That's actually, I guess that's supposed to be foreshadowing. So here's the thing that, I, that you have to keep in mind. 
this pilgrimage Yun is going on. She needs, she needs to do this to defeat Sin. You can defeat Sin temporarily by going to all these temples and saying a bunch of prayers and earning all your summon monsters. But at the end of it, Yuna has to die. She has to sacrifice herself at the end of the pilgrimage. And everybody on Earth knows this except for Titus. And he finds out later in the game and it's like a big whoa moment. So there's all these little moments on the road where, like, you watch these character interactions, like this one where they're telling you that you don't need all that luggage because you're, you know, oh, they're, you know, it's gifts for all the temples and stuff. But the the subtext there is because you're gonna die, you're not coming back here. Like, and that's another thing in this game story that stretches. That I don't find credible. I don't find it credible that Titus makes it that far in the journey without learning this. A funny thing happened. My dog dug up something yesterday. Oh, go find the dog. Alright, good looking out. Let's find this dog. Where is Doggo? But, yeah, like, Yuna's death is such a major element in this world as far as like what the summoner's job is and what she has to do. I just don't find it credible. Even if Unit tells all her friends, hey, nobody tell Titus what happens at the end. Like, I don't want him to know and look at me differently. You figure these, that you, you meet everybody on the road, all these people, all these citizens of the world, like they all know what has to happen but nobody explains it to Titus at any point. Like, he doesn't even just hear it in passing in a shop or in a town or... Like, it makes sense why Yuna didn't want to tell him, but, like, Yuna couldn't tell everybody in every village they passed through, hey, don't tell my boyfriend what happens to the summoner at the end. A uh, dog's not in the temple. That would be ridiculous. Well, like, in day-to-day -day life, like, we discuss things that ever, that we know all the time. Like, that's just kind of how conversation works. And so many summoners making pilgrimages through these villagers right now. Where's this dog at? Where's Dogbert? Is he in one of these other huts, maybe? No, there were cats in here. Check some of these other huts. Ah, dogbird. Obtain something mangled and slobbery. Oh, okay. I'm presuming that's not a missable item. Because I've never gotten that before. I'm presuming that's not missable, though. Like, I could have come back to be saved later to get that. I like Squall a lot. I, I really appreciated Squall more as I played the game and paid careful attention to, like, what actually gets said over the course of the game. Here comes one now. Hey, why don't you try out that sword I gave you? Ah, the dingo ate your baby. No it's not too shabby. You kept up with him pretty well. Might make a good guardian something. So the, the system here is that flying enemies have much higher evade. So you need a character like Waka whose accuracy is much higher. Why Final Fantasy games have this idea that like ranged weapons you have to aim have higher accuracy than melee weapons? I'm not sure. Uh, okay. I don't want to go to the sphere grid yet. I, don't, I just don't want to. Do I have to do anything to activate that overdrive? No, I just have two different overdrives. Okay, so Lulu starts with everything she needs right off the bat. Good.
Yeah, but even in uh, like Final Fantasy VII, what like I think the only uh, maximum accuracy rec weapon you can get is for Vincent. It's not gonna work, Titus. Don't do it. Don't do it. Nope. Told you. Only magic could beat that thing. Well, no, I could kill it 49 damage at a time. Magic of an element they don't like. Magic? Element? Let's have our black mage show you what I mean. Ooh, that's an unnatural wine. Clueless, aren't you? Good thing I'm here. Spells of ice work well against fire fiends, and ice fiends are weak against fire magic. You follow? I get fire and ice, but what about lightning and water? Lightning and water are opposed, just like fire and ice. Yeah, he gets it. That's not what he was asking. Which means... <laughs> okay, so we're going to use thunder on a water plan. She has a 255 fist. I think she only has two fists. If you look in the game, if you look carefully. I actually learned that last time I played Final Fantasy VII on stream. Somebody in chat was like, hey man, take Vincent's 255 accuracy weapon and give him the death blow materia and just let him get the work done. And I'm like, oh, okay. As long as the work's getting done. going on this isn't the way to the oh good thanks for pointing that out I still wanted to go down there maybe there's treasure Titus you don't know it's an ancient custom people leaving the island pray here for a safe trip Chapu didn't pray that day. Said he'd miss his boat. I'm not praying for your dead That's brother, your dude. I gotta get to the boat, because that's where my next Albed primer is, so... Uh, I'm not looking for extra cringe. There's a save point way up there on that ledge for some reason uh that's an airship puzzle for later i think there's a reason for that i'm glad we get that shot of kamari's diaper from behind like i'm glad they put that in the game Wow, Kamara's bad at this. I'm never going to get that on the first try, by the way. Titus' is limit break. It's never going to happen. Also, I'm going to keep calling them limit breaks. That's enough. What's with that guy? Kimari Ronto, of the Ronto tribe. He's learned the fiend's way of fighting. So, the... Kimari's the only character in this game that has a last name. Nobody else does. I assume all of their last name is just human? Like, there's Titus human, and Yuna human, and Lulu human? But he has protected me since I was a child. 
Hmm. Oh, did we keep... Okay, so we kept this long sword. We have this hunter sword with sensor. Sensor is a good ability, but I think I'd rather just have the strength for now. Oh, I gotta give her a rod that I found. We should try to make sure that we win all the summoner fights in this game. I usually lose every single one of those summoner fights. Because they usually summon, like, the newest Aeon, and you can't summon one that they have out. And then I usually just keep losing over and over I don't know that for a fact. Maybe one of the NPCs in the world is named Waka. What do we get from a regular attack? Alright, that's a lot better than Sonic Wings. Yeah, if you can go in with a full overdrive, but I guess I just never think to do that. Sonic Boom! Oh, that is his full name. Waka Waka, you're right. So they, they just, they have the same description, but this one's just better. I mean, maybe those fights will be easier to win now that I have this overdrive that I've never seen before. So only Yuna got AP for that, because she's the only one who actually took an action. But she does have a couple of weapon options here. Ooh. That's the good stuff right there. We got that from the Destruction Spear. Maybe Lulu is like a shortened name. Maybe it's like short for Lululu and her full name is Lululu Lululu. That's probably correct. Yeah, we got Energy Blast. It's all good. Oh, let's just burn it. So, we do have to make sure people get turns. So there's not really anything she can do here. And I don't want her to summon an Aeon because so nobody gets AP. So we're just going to have her take a turn and do nothing. He's already taken a turn, so we'll swap him off for Titus. So 
So everybody's taking at least one action so everybody can get a little some some. And now that she's taken a garbage action, I can swap Waka back in. Only characters that perform actions take turns. So if Yuna summons an Aeon before everybody's taken at least one action, only Yuna and will, her Aeon will gain AP. A Baroque Sword. This game, like, inundates you with weapons. I don't want strength plus three. So I think what I'm just going to do is get a blue magic list. Because that's how you earn Lancet. Or earn blue magic, right? Is you use Lancet abilities. So Yuna has to come in and can I multi-target? No. I remember the first time I played this, I like never unequipped Brotherhood. There was really no reason to. What's this way? Oh, this goes to the beach, doesn't it? Goes to the overlook. All right, let's go ahead and there's only not much point to spending spear levels right now. We only got like one. So let's not do that. I do want to take a look though. It zooms out. There we go. Uh, okay. Oh, Kimari's not on here yet, though. I'm not able to find steel and stuff. What does cheer do? Everybody starts at the beginning, so Kimari's just going to start here. Oh, there's steel. Okay, it's right here. It's behind a level one block. So I'm not getting here from any other way. Because there's a level one lock from that direction too. Okay. So I guess Kimari, we're just not going to do anything until... I guess we can make him our stealer. So the idea is everybody starts in the middle, then fans out. I don't think I'm going to divert anybody. We're just going to have Kimari go up this way. If it boosts speed, it's like brokenly good. Stack it five times. Does it does it run out or does it last for the whole battle? What's up, big guy? He doesn't want to talk to me. 
Nobody wants to talk to me. So on this boat in the engine room... Yeah, in the, in the room with the chocobos running on the wheels. We have not played any Blitzball yet, no. So I think on the boat is where I have to worry about the Jex shot. So I'm glad I saved there. So in this scene, like, Titus just thinks Yuna's saying goodbye to her friends and goodbye to be safe because we're going on a long trip. She's actually, like, these people will never see her again. So they wouldn't just be standing there waving. Like, I guess that kid is, like, kind of sad, but... <laughs> like, it, it doesn't seem credible that Titus could get past this scene without learning that Yuna is on a, a death journey. Like, yeah, several of the NPCs were crying, but that's not... That's not how you cry when, like, you're you're seeing a person that you know is going to die imminently. Like, that was a little kid, like, oh, I'm sad because my friend is leaving. That, like, if... I don't know. I feel like the scene should look very different if every NPC on the boat and on the dock knows Yuna is about to die. It would have looked different. <laughs> Maybe people just drink salt water in this world. That's why everybody has to live by the ocean. Rainwater is not palatable to them. It makes as much sense as any of the other lore in this game. Can I get my Albed Primer now? Ooh, is that a box? Well, I see. No, it's not a box. Okay. So we're going to go into the boat. Here's the captain. Like, you can kind of see a world map on the wall right here, but it's not a very good render of it. But like just incidental NPCs, like this note, this guy here, like Tita strikes up a conversation with them. Wouldn't be like, oh, are you Yuna's new guardian? Like, did you know her long? Like that's the kind of language you would use for somebody who's on it. I don't know. Wait, is this not the boat that, or is it the boat to Luca? Which boat is this? This is the Leaky. So I gotta make sure I get it here, but there wasn't really anywhere to go below deck. I know where the ball is. I'm trying to get below deck so I can get an Albed Primer. Oh, there it is, right there. Herp. Herp in the derp. Oh, waka. So I have to make sure I give him the money he wants before Operation Mehen. Herpens, you derp. Okay.
Keep is like the bombastic goalie, right? Like one of the original Besaid guys is like the best goalie in the game or something. Oh, Wakar. Say, lad, you wouldn't. I have some. Wait, can you? Are you gonna sell me something? Wait a minute. Cancel. Before I give you all my money for free, like, do you have a shop? Oh, I guess not. Okay, so yeah, let's just give him... Is there a particular amount I should give him? Because I'm just going to give him 1100 if not. One thousand and one. That's all he wants is a thousand and one. Trouble, what are you doing? Why is this happening? Ban yourself. Uh, yeah, you can have it. I guess it pays to ask. Thank you kindly, lad. Fine, see money for your Oaka merchant empire. So I need to give him ten thousand and one, all told, before. Operation Me Him. What, what the heck is what? What is this place? The power room, like it says on the door. Yeah, but why the big birds? What's so strange about chocobo power? Chocobos? Those are chocobos? What? You've never seen a chocobo? What kind of backwater island did you come from, anyway? <laughs> hmm. Miracles and oddities were starting to become daily routine on this trip. That's nice. There's an Albed primer in here. Oh, there it is. Nice. Okay, number four is in Kilika Tavern. Gotcha. We hate chocobos in this game, don't we? They're they're. Harbingers of evil. I'm going to save here in case I screw up the Jex shot. Or is the Jex shot on the next... No, we fight Sin on this boat. Then the next boat is the Jex shot. The boat to Luka. Or it's right here. I guess I don't know. I have no memory. Word is that summoner's got noble blood. I heard she's Lord Braska's daughter. You don't say. See, like, these guys right here. Lord Braska's daughter? They're not. <laughs> they wouldn't be talking about a woman like this that they know is about to die. So, is Yuna's father famous or something? She's the daughter of High Summoner Braska. You saw his statue at the temple. Lord Braska defeated Sin ten years ago. So 10,001 is... I don't have to give it to him all at once. I can give it to him over time. So I have to give him 9,000 more gold. Is that the idea? Huh? Walker's a bit lacking in the imagination department. Huh? <laughs> Thanks, Lulu. I'll keep that in mind. Stay away from the summoner. I want to hear a high fellow say that now. Stay away from the summoner. Oddly enough, this is not the cringy laughing scene everybody always makes fun of this game for. There's a much cringier one later. <clears throat> you 
a football player, aren't you? From Zanakin, right? Uh, you hear that from Waka? Mm-hmm. Huh. Waka. Waka doesn't believe me at all. <laughs> but I believe you. Huh? <laughs> I've heard in Zanakin there is a great stadium all lit up even at night. Huh? Great blitz of all tournaments are held there. And the stands are always full. How do you know that? A man named Jack told me. He was my father's guardian. So she made this connection, but Waka didn't? Like, Jake. Uh, maybe Waka didn't meet Jack. No, he must have. My father. His name is Jack. This must be the blessing of Yevon. Sounds like him, but it can't be him. Why not? My old man. Waka is definitely the dumbs. He is like seven dumb. Ten years ago, <laughs> off the coast of Zanarkin. seen him since then why that's the day that huh? Jack came to Spira but, uh... it's true I first met Jack ten years and three months ago I remember that was the day my father left the date fits doesn't it the... The... <laughs> yeah but Every time I play or see this game, the, the voice acting is worse than I remembered it. Are you not? <laughs> so I'm sure they do give some kind of explanation for it, Sebastian. They do kind of put a band-aid on it, but... It's just, it's the kind of thing that no explanation is really convincing to me. Because the whole idea of a pilgrimage is they meet hundreds of people. Like, it, it just stretches credibility too much. It would be like in 2020, somebody showing up in our cult, and like right now with no knowledge of what's going on. And then making it like four months before they're like, wait, there's a pandemic? Nobody told me about COVID. What's going on? Like, even if the people that guy was staying with, they said, let's not tell them about it and it'll mess him up. Like, just interfacing with other people in the culture, you do just absorb things through osmosis. So it, it just stretches credibility that Titus doesn't learn anything about Spira except the things that these six specific people tell him directly this is a cool scene though with sin attacking like i like that you get your first like taste of sin here did i learn cheer i didn't learn anything i didn't do anything in this fear grid Like, imagine a version of this story where Titus learns on Besaid that the summoner at the end of the pilgrimage dies. Like, he are, he knows that at this point in the story, but because he's not from Spira, he just decides, I'm not going to just accept this. Like, I just met this girl, she seems nice, and I'm going on this adventure with them. But that's kind of the role he ends up taking anyway, is like, I'm not going to accept this. I'm going to be the guy that figure self something else out for her like they could have that character moment earlier in the game on be said and have that strong moment early and the only thing you would lose is it doesn't come up later as a plot twist like i i don't think the story gains anything by hiding that information from the player 
Uh, I'm not gonna do anything with you. Just throw out an attack, I guess. Whap. Uh, lance at that guy. Word. But then we can have that as a strength of Tidus' character from the very beginning. Like, we already know he's the guy who will uh, go against tradition because somebody he hasn't even met yet is in danger. Like, he's willing to, to, to do that. We can just reinforce that immediately. He can learn after, like, Valifor gets summoned or something. Like, somebody will mention it. And he just doesn't want to accept it. And because it's before he really gets to know Yuna very well, he's not completely distraught over it. Like, it would, couldn't... It, maybe it doesn't completely feel real to him. I don't know. There's other ways they could have done it where they don't raise questions of credibility. Yeah, go ahead and throw a soccer ball at the giant sea monster. Good idea. Oh, flickering wings. We know this is bad. Uh, I think we'll break Mr. Flicker here. And then we'll have Waka... That looks so dumb. I'm s that just looks so dumb. So I, I can appreciate like they wanted fully animated characters in this game. Like the character doesn't just wave his sword around in the air. Like he actually has to jump up to the character. So I get that that's realistic in the game's fiction, but it just looks really silly. Woo! Boop! We booped it. The ball just disappears into the impossible distance. You hear a far off just noise. Woo! Boop! <laughs> I'm gonna do that every time, I'm sorry. Gonna do it every time. You can cheer for me, Trouble. You can cheer me on, if you want. Maybe he's just carrying, like, a whole bunch of balls. Maybe he's got more than one. Woo! Boop! So good. So very good. Oh, don't be... Sorry, I didn't mean to be dumb. So this is a situation, like, I want to heal Tidus here, but uh, I can't cycle Yuna in without Tidus leaving the group from this position. But I think he can safely eat two monster attacks. So on Lulu's next turn... We'll cycle Yuna in. do that. I cheer trouble on every Sunday in D&D. &D. Woo! Boop! So good. Alright, uh, let's get Lulu back out.
So we're going to reach a point where everybody has infinite speed, though, so... The wangs start to flicker. I think we killed two guys this round. Yeah, because Dina's going to get another move, so... You get thundered on, nerd. And you get attacked on, nerd. I really like Lulu's just basic attack animation. It's really funny. Like, giving her a death... She'll probably... Like, first opportunity I have to give somebody a death strike weapon. I mean, it just makes sense for Lulu. Because she doesn't have the strength to really make her attack useful. So having something like Stone Strike or Death Strike is just good for her character. But aside from that, her attack, man, is really cool looking. Just... Herp -de -herp -de -herp. Boink. Little dolls just hopping around. I like it. Oh, are those wings flickering? I think they're flickering, but Lulu gets a turn next. Orin is a truck, you find out. That's another one of the really dumb plot choices in this game. You find out that he actually is a truck. Uh, who walks like a man. Woo! Boop! Well, I guess it does always boomerang back to him. Can you hit the... Oh, you can hit up there, too. Let's do that. Uh, I'm not sure how I would overkill this boss. I would need... I can censor him like this. I'm not close. 667. How would I do a thousand damage? With, an, with like Valifor's overdrive, maybe? Or Lulu's overdrive, perhaps? Yeah, I'm not going to have an overdrive for this boss. Uh, Lulu's down to 200 health. So I hope you guys find time this week, if not on Christmas Day, but you find time hopefully to watch my Christmas video. It'll go up Christmas morning. It is a yearly tradition on my channel. I picked a game that I'm sure everybody will love to see. Is it worth forcing the overdrive here? Like, should I... I could force it. I could force Lulu's overdrive. I'd rather not, though, unless it's something really good. Like, if it's a really out-of-depth weapon or something. I haven't played Super Metroid in a while, it's true. I think 1987 was the last time I played it. It's been a while. Yeah, it's going to take, like, dozens of those spines to fill up her overdrive. It's going to take forever. Yeah, it's not worth it for that 
for like 10 AP. Oh, that's the one that got him, huh? That's that's the hit that got it down. It's like that one specific spot on Sin's massive, unbelievably huge body. If you tap it just enough times, it gets pissed off and doesn't destroy your boat. If there really are important overkills, be sure to let me know, but... There's nothing going to be missable in an overkill situation. I think Geos Gyno, I think the page said, has a 50% drop that I need to get. But other than that, I'm not really worried about it. I'm only really concerned about stuff that's missable. Stuff that if I don't get it, I won't be able to go back and get it later. I guess he threw a potion at me? Okay. So I think we just determined the earliest key sphere we can get is on me and high road. Is that correct? Since spawn at this. I got sin scales here. blind this dude ha you're blinded I do like Titus's attack animations underwater and I like the sound of Titus's sword it's just a very satisfying hit that's so important in RPGs like they have satisfying visceral feeling hits a lot of JRPGs uh, didn't do that. But that sword hit, that just feels good. Always feels good to do. Uh, you sh you're doing more damage, so you attack. Don't swim back to the boat, guys. Whatever you do, make sure you don't just swim back up to the boat. That would be ridiculous. Ooh, his drain looks like it wore off. Holy Swords in Final Fantasy IV are pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, it's the same potion animation.
No, we didn't get the overkill on him either. I'm okay with not overkilling absolutely every boss. Like we're gonna, we'll get more ability spheres down the road. We're not gonna be hurting for them. And if we are, just like somebody doesn't level up right away, it's not the biggest deal in the world. And this poor town is dead now. It's funny as I'm seeing these cutscenes and I'm recognizing a lot of them from my villainous decks. Like that's the shot that I use for Tidal Wave in the Sin deck. Also, without sensor weapons, it's kind of hard to set up the uh, the overkill because you don't know how many hit points the monster has left. Like, these, these people just rebuild all of this breakable stuff. Over and over and over and over and over again. They have this whole island they can build on. But they make sure all of their stuff is right on the beach or literally over the water. Nobody built houses up on the hill. Up, up on the island itself. Everybody's right there on the beach. When Sin attacks Anderson that day, I woke up in Spira. I kept hoping it would work in reverse, too. I will defeat Sin. Guys, I live in Florida. I am five minutes away from the Gulf of Mexico. And, like, we don't get big tidal waves or anything, but there isn't... Like, I do know what storm surge is. Like, there are flooding zones and things. Higher elevation you go, the less chance that your hut gets destroyed. This wasn't Sin attacking the town. This was Sin creating a tidal wave that hit the town. If the whole town weren't literally on the beach and on the ocean, if they if their huts were up on that hill, on the middle of the island, that tidal wave would not have destroyed everything they had. All I'm saying, just... Like, yeah, Sin himself could come over and destroy the island fine, but that's not what happened here. That was a tidal wave that Sin created. I just conclude that everybody in Spirit is completely stupid. Part of the human condition in the world of Spirit is just being absolutely idiot. Somebody in town is like, well... I've done lost my whole family and my dog when the tidal wave came in, but I look forward to building my hut on the water again. <laughs> I think Unaleska kind of touches on this later, like why she wants this spiral of death to be what it is. I just don't know that I believe an entire culture buys into it for a thousand years, which is what the game's story is. I think this is probably a good spot. We have some sphere levels now. Kimari has a sphere level. I, get, I he took an action in that boss fight, but... Uh, so we're going to send Kimari this way. So scan is probably good. I should probably get him extract. Oh, Yuna can get it as well. She's right here. Maybe I should give Yuna the extract. Give her this extract ability command to start with. So she has that, and Kimari... Well, Kimari's not any actually near these ones. He's close... 
Yuna and Kimari can both take extract ability. I think we'll start there. Oh, you can't go anywhere. You're stuck there because you've only got one level. Fine. Uh, you. Take extract ability. Then you can, you're coming down here and getting null. She didn't grab this strength node, but that's fine for now. Wait, what's... Okay, there's nothing else she can really get here. Uh, you know what? I'm going to move her up one more and get the scan. So she's going to take just a brief detour here. So she can have scan. And then increase her magic. And then I can get her back here. Okay, it's good for Yuna. No, if you're on a node, you can activate the node you're on or the node next to it. That much I do know. Uh, what about you? Like, I mean, Waka could just, a oh, Waka's over here. Okay. So we're just gonna move him along his path. Like we're not gonna do anything silly with Waka. Uh, where's Waka going from here? He has two options. I can either go up this way. Guard. This is... Is this Waka up here? Use is... Over here. So Kimari, once I get level one key, is going to come through here and get steel and use. So he's going that way. Level three lock. Level one lock. So I guess Waka can go this way. Or he can go up here and start. This is Orin's section, right? Orin's the one that gets the breaks. So I don't want to send him that way then. Uh, Lulu should be easy. Like, it's just where's where the black magic be at though? Like, it's just she's right down here. Yeah, we're just gonna. Don't need to even screw around with this. What does Jinx do? I can't see what stuff does from this menu. I don't think I want to backtrack for Jinx, right? Unless Jinx is like amazing. But something tells me it's not. Uh, we can get you started, I guess. We don't need to leave you there. Lowers luck. I don't know that I'm into that right now. I think we're going to just move him up along. But yeah, you spend a lot of time in the game just doing this. And there's not really interesting decisions here to make. It's just doing the next step in... In the development of the character. So eventually we're, we're going to be able to go back to spheres like this, where it says strength by one point. We're going to be able to destroy it and replace it with like strength four points or something. That's something we can do eventually. And I think you want to keep going up, right? Yeah, because you're going to go get haste. Haste is your jam. There's extract power.
Uh, that's kind of a big detour, though. I think I'd rather continue moving forward for now. Like, I don't think we're going to be hurting for power spheres, basically. All right, cool. So we need to find the tavern here. And there's an Albed primer to pick up. It's just on the counter in there. Cool. See, they're already rebuilding. Uh, we better build our... Like, this isn't a dock or a port or anything. It's just... They're just building houses out here over the water. Like, there's no need for buildings out over the water like this. Unless there are aesthetic reasons you're doing it. Like, yeah, the port has, to, like, the, if it's a dock, but there are buildings out here. There's, like, huts. People live out here. No. Build your huts on the island. Up on the hillside, right? Where all those trees over there are still standing. Like, the tidal wave didn't get everything. Uh, I am culture shaming them. You bet. Absolutely. Sand fleas? The sand fleas are eating all of their rations? The dead need guidance. Filled with grief over their own death, they refuse to face their fate. They yearn to live on and resent those still alive. You see, they envy the living. And this is the part that, this is why I don't find the thing with unsent credible. An unsent is still alive in every meaningful sense of being alive. You exist, you have senses, you experience stimulus, you can move around, you can affect things. Like, you're alive by any reasonable measure. So what does it mean to envy the living if you are still alive? Where they may rest in peace. Summoners do this? Hmm. Lulu tries to draw a distinction here between being alive and being dead, where there really isn't one in this world. In order to draw the distinction like she just did, you have to have an understanding of life and death the way we do on Earth. But if you have our understanding of life and death, then there's no need to send anyone anywhere. Because once you're dead, you're dead. You can't move. You can't respond to stimulus. You can't move around. You can't affect things. You're not alive anymore. So the game tries to have it both ways. It tries to set up this situation where we're supposed to understand that these people are dead in the sense that we think they're dead. They've been killed but also dead in the sense that Spira acknowledges that they're dead, which means they're not killed. They, could, they're, they still exist, but they have to be sent to the next plane of existence by this magic ritual. Well, most of them can trouble. Most of the things can be handed away by saying that, yeah, their religion is dumb. But the thing is... This, the sending process, this works. This isn't just like the Church of Yevon pushing nonsense onto people. This is actually a metaphysical interaction that works in this world because life and death have particular characteristics. This sending unit here is doing isn't an illusion. This is actually functioning. And it's actually sending these souls to the far plane. This would work regardless of what you Yevon teaches. Huh. 
I've heard that explanation too that it's just this the the, the strong willpower explan explanation but again that implies that nobody in this world has strong willpower or virtually nobody and if it's true if some people some number of people do then it should be more common there should be more unsent in the world that have that strong willpower and you don't encounter people as a matter of course because it's unfair to send somebody who doesn't or wouldn't otherwise turn into a fiend like imagine the situation like you get killed by sin you haven't been sent yet but you're one of these people that have strong willpower you don't feel unnatural anger you're not going to turn into a fiend but they are going to send you anyway sending is effectively what we would call death you are sent away from this existence. You can no longer affect things here. Stimulus here no longer touches you. The nature of your consciousness isn't actually explored, but being sent in this world is the same as being killed in ours. So this must raise situations where like somebody could keep living as an unsent with no ill effects, but people Your want to send the them anyway. That's just unfair to them. Strange. And somehow, horrifying. <laughs> I never wanted to see it again. I think there are three unsent characters over the course of the plot. And the implication, if I'm reading the game's intent correctly, and I remember what's going on correctly, uh, the implication is, I think, it's not possible to fend off becoming a fiend forever. Eventually, everybody succumbs which is why it's important to send people. Two of the unsent in this story are in the process of that happening. And it actually does happen to because they become boss fights. And it's implied that the third is kind of on borrowed time. Like he's already pushed past the point where he's comfortable and he does get sent at the end of the game. So I think that's the implication. Like that's what the game wants you to believe. But the way it conveys that is by saying these three people and nobody else in the world are super cool enough to not have to be sent. And they only turn into fiends when your heroes show up and start hitting them with swords. So maybe don't start hitting unsent people with swords and everything will be fine. <laughs> I don't know. Like I said, I just I don't think there an explanation exists that I would find credible. I gotta go find the tavern. Oh, he's probably going back to Waka. Let's go find the tavern and find our Elbed Primer. But yeah, these idiots built their whole stupid village over the water. Like I don't feel bad for them. I'm sorry. Okay, so this guy has been affected by toxin. What's he say? Oh, he's just a jerk. So the toxin... So the toxin affects different people in different ways. It makes Titus an idiot, but it makes this guy a jerk. So. Oh, I don't remember that NPC trouble. It's been many years since I've done the Cave of Stolen Faith. That's where you find Yojimbo, yes? It's in the Calm Lands somewhere. Tidus isn't a jerk on purpose. He's a jerk because people won't tell him what the hell's going on. Are you the tavern? Aha, got it. So our next Albed Pramian is on the SS Winnow on the bridge. Oh, that's right. Trema is also an un is that his name? Seymour? No, J uh, Jiskel was an unsent. Actually, no. Now that I'm recalling, don't the Guado kind of do that routinely? They kind of have a routine of not sending. Like all the high maesters and stuff are unsent, aren't they? Go! I 
The summoner O'Hallan used to live in the Kilika Temple here. Yep. Lord O'Hallan was once a grave glitter, you know. Waka. Hmm? Praying for victories, all good. <sighs> but is this right? Something wrong with enjoying Glitzball? <laughs> is this really the time? This is the only time. The players fight. I, you can't put that on Titus, though. Like, I'm the one telling him to steal that all the people's stuff. Like, I'm the one who made him open that treasure box. That's why Glitz has been around for so long. At least that's what I think. Whatever you say. Let's play and win. Right? Right. Temple's beyond the jungle there. Let's go. I think I'm too important to die. I don't ever want to die. Are you kidding me? Given the choice, I'll stay alive. I do not understand the the notion that like, oh, just because death is natural, like everybody's going to die. Well, okay, but like if we find a solution to death and then we don't have to die, like, are you still going to? Like... I cannot imagine ever thinking, ah, I think I'm just gonna go ahead and die today. What's up? Yuna's saying she wants Altered Carbon is a show on Netflix that kind of plays with the idea a little bit. The the show's kind of moral is if people live too long, they become like these weird, unnatural, eternal, just horrible things. Maybe, but I'm not a guardian then. I just want him nearby. Oh, she wants the D. That's what she wants. What? What do you mean? It's just that... So the reason Yoon is really into Titus is because he's the only person that doesn't know she's going to die. So she's the only... He's the only person that doesn't treat her differently. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have... She's never met anybody in her life before because she's been, she's been groomed as being this summoner her whole life. My apologies. And Titus is the only person who has not been involved in that. And so she likes being around him because he kind of treats her like a person and not this, like, object of salvation. Oh, is it tutorial time? Why you use Lancet on it? What's a Lancet? Normally, it's a skill that weakens enemies and heals the user. But when Alonso uses it, that Ronso can sometimes learn Fiend's abilities. Hey, sounds cool. Kimari is the worst blue mage. Are we all on board with that? That's not a controversial... Like, Kimari's the worst one, right? There's not a blue mage worse than Kimari? Trouble. Thank you for the Koopo chat. Uh, you haven't acted yet. So we can get all the ability spheres we want with Yuna now. So as long as Yun is in the party, anybody, everybody gets the opportunity to censor. Anyone thirsty? Yeah. 
Someone is. I can take care of those alone, huh? Booyah. Booyah. The battle voices are good. Like the little battle clips. They got them right. Mostly right. Am I going to get good drops from the bugs in this forest, though? So. Oh, that's right. I have equipment I can give up. Ice strike. Ooh, sensor. I like sensor. I'm going to use arm guard. Water ward. Yeah, if I do that, she'll never get experience, so. Eventually, like, Waka and Tidus, like, their end of battle equip becomes a pretty good indicator of, like, when the battle is over. <laughs> Who are Bengals? You do. We have two identical Bengals. What are you? Okay. Just out bed. Text. The fiend before us is Ochu, Lord of the Wood. We've had trouble with this one before. Remember, discretion is the better part of valor. Or we could clear out this area of the wood, right? And build a nice palisade wall. And then build a bunch of huts and stuff inside for people to live in. And then people can live up here instead of down on the beach. Uh, should I not fight this guy? I'm gonna hit the save point and fight that guy. Uh, I know I can't lance it anything from this guy, but I'm gonna use it just so it can burn up a turn. I'm ready. Build up an overdrive for my summon. I should do that here. Like it's already time for that. I can't hit my own characters to build overdrive, can I? If I want to overkill Ochu, what does o Ochu drop if I overkill it? I mean, it's probably just a smart idea to build up overdrive for summons anyway. Oh, I, I gotta turn these off. These, these long animations. Alright, I'll get the I'll get in the habit of doing that, making sure to fill up their overdrives and Please keep them there. Fight with us. I mean these guys just aren't gonna survive long though. 
Oh, there we go. Yeah, boost. Okay. That took like two seconds. <laughs> All right, dismissed. See ya. I was expecting it to take a lot longer. Surprise fire didn't kill that thing. Like, one of the overdrive modes is just deal damage to an enemy. And you can pair that with triple overdrive on a weapon to just get an overdrive, like, every three turns. Rule Breaker. Ah, oh, we like some Poison Touch. That'll do. Poison is really good in this game. Should I build up Yuna's Overdrive, too? Then... How long would that take? Turn off animations. Yes, thank you. I will do that. Good. Good, good, good. Uh, how long is it going to take to build up units overdrive? I think most, if not all, of the celestial weapons have triple overdrive, yes. see if I can fill up her. What happened to your accuracy, Waka? What happened to your awesome accuracy that you're supposed to have, you bastard? Like, filling up her overdrive is going to take forever. We need to get Kimari a turn, actually. No, I think filling up her overdrive is going to take forever, so... Hopefully I can... Really? Leave him with one hit point? Is that what we're doing? Oh, I got poison though. Haha, -ha, nerd. Newbie here. Sorry. Don't strain yourself. I'll handle the bird. It's a bug, not a bird, moron. You were saying, Waka, who's going to handle the bird?
All right, yeah, I'm not gonna fill up her. Over if it's gonna take too long. How much health does this thing have? Oh, you don't know. Immune? Oh, probably mean to poison. Forty one hundred. He falls asleep, summon Valifor. Got it. She'll get a healer overdrive mode eventually, I think. Heal an enemy 60 times, or an ally 60 times. That'll happen eventually, but it won't happen anytime soon. So I don't want to overdrive it yet. I want to make sure to kill it with the overdrive. A lot of hit points back. Okay, but it's not going to regenerate anymore, is it? Valifor is going to die if he takes too many more of those. Maybe I should shield. Okay, that was a good investment. My understanding is every character can learn every overdrive mode, but at the beginning of the game, it's not likely most characters will learn most of them. Like, if I don't overdrive here, though, Valifor is dead. So... Dismiss until it falls asleep again? It was out of MP anyway.
down under a thousand now. So I should be able to safely summon from here. Because he's got less than a thousand hit points, this ability is going to do more than a thousand damage. So let's bring in the boy. Bring in the big boy. I do like the little animation there, like when Balafor gets summoned in. And Blast is the good one, I think. Blast is the one we want. Oh yeah, we <laughs> 1800. If I don't know when it was going to do that much, we could have killed him sooner. Two MP spheres, nice. Whoa. A summoner and her guardians. Very impressive. Would you like to kiss so we the boots? We'll get our chance soon enough. Young crusaders gather around. All right, so those actually, if I understand this correctly, yeah, so that doesn't increase somebody's magic points. That takes an empty node on the grid and turns it into a node that should give plus something MP. I don't need to save scum this, do I? Like, I don't need to use it and hopefully it adds plus four, right? It's always going to make, like, an MP whatever the highest... MP node can be. I think I'm phrasing that that question badly, but um, yeah. I want to spend these sphere levels now. It always adds plus four. Okay, that's good to know. Uh, I'm gonna put. Is it better to give those to Luna, Lulu, and Yuna, or should I give one to Titus and one to... You know, I'm just going to give one, put one on Yuna's portion and one on Lulu's portion. That way anybody who comes in behind them to learn white or black magic gets that MP. Oops, screwed that up. And we don't want to take him down this way. Do we? No. That goes into Orin's section. We could send him down Orin's path and then send Orin down his path, I guess. If we wanted to. We'd miss out on delay attack for a little while, I think, if we did that. Uh, what could we get if we did that? We could send, get guard, and then after a few more levels, he would start getting the break abilities. No, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to leave the people the way they are. Well, cause, yeah, because eventually this leads to Hastega, which is the real, real good stuff. All right, you want to go... Of this way is Orin's path, so we're going to ignore that. You want to come down here. You just backtracked a little bit to get scanned, but now you're going to come. So what we're going to do is... Pop this right here, I guess? I 
guess there's no reason to not just put it here. Oh, she gets 40 MP from that, not four. Nice. Um, you know what? You're right. It will be good for Titus to have more MP as well. If it was just plus four, I don't think it'd be worth it. But I, if it's 40, I do think this is a good idea. Let's just do this. Because that like doubles his MP or something. Uh, we want to get him these nodes as well while we're here while we're here once he gets more movement You, sir. I just have him grab the stuff around the middle. Like, he doesn't have to... Like, eventually... It's going to be a while before we can bust this, so he might as well just move around here and take the stuff that's here. So now I need another ability sphere. And he can get extract ability. Let's get Kimari, not Lulu. We did almost double Tidus's MP. That's amazing. I shouldn't save Titus's overdrive. There, now he also can extract ability. That's good. Let's just use it up then. Check this out. There's nothing anybody else can really do then. I guess you can... I always forget what's in the special menu and what's in the skill menu. spheres for that because we overkilled it and indeed we do all right we've been down this way
Oh yeah, good call. Let's refill Valifor's nonsense. I don't know if boost stacks, but looks like it doesn't. But there's nothing else I want to do here. This lizard's really slow. Come on, lizard friend, get in the game. Is lizard friend going to do anything? Oh, Lizard Fred can't, because I'm flying. Lizard... He can't do anything to me. Well, fine. I just... He's going to take a lot longer, then. I don't want to slap the lizard because then somebody in my actual party won't get a turn. I'd rather wait until after I dismiss Valifor and then have Titus slap the lizard. Alright, now we can dismiss. Resigned to slapping the lizard? That sounds disgusting. Disgusting. It'll take more than one shot to do the job. Why don't you let the boy handle that one? <laughs> the boy. It's like a pet peeve of mine when weapons in games have, like, no weight to them at all. Just still... So we just hit monsters and they drop speed spheres there, but not interested, really. Alright, we've been down that way, too. Does Yuna really only have like 350 health? No, she was missing a little bit of health. Alright, we're back guys. Two minutes. I'm going to go say hi to my wife. We just had a big, long fried chicken discussion on Discord earlier today, and that's what my wife just brought home for dinner. 
And I've actually been streaming longer than I thought. I'm going to go ahead and save here and eat my dinner. Uh, I might do a second stream later today, actually. It's... So I want to go a little further in this game, but streaming more than six hours on YouTube is a bad idea anyway because it does some funky stuff with the video editor. So I might eat my dinner and relax for a little bit and do a second stream later tonight. I'm sure nobody would mind, right? Like everybody's would be okay with that? Come back and do another four hours in a little bit? But I'm hungry and that chicken is smelling real good. And my stomach is growling. So, cheer! Let's give them all we got. Could it, is, this game is going to be like a long, methodical climb. That's what it's going to feel like. As we move through it. It's not completely unenjoyable, but it is going to take a minute. <laughs> It is a kind of plotting sort of game. So let's run back to the save point here. Oh, which is good, because Valifor is almost dead anyway. I want to thank everybody for hanging out. Uh, I'm going to go eat my dinner. I'll see how I feel after that, if I want to come back on and do another stream today or not. Uh, thanks, everybody, for watching. I'm going to enjoy my dinner. Peace out. Uh, not really going to go to sleep, but next time you sleep, make sure you sleep well.